Good evening, everyone. My name is Barbara Blake. I'm the chair of this committee and I'm a Seven Sisters Ward Councillor. If I can ask the committee to introduce themselves, starting on my left, please. Councillor Nicola Bartlett, West Green Ward. Councillor Ajda Ovet, Northumberland Park Ward. Councillor John Bevan, Northumberland Park Ward. Councillor Lester Buxton, Crouch End Ward. Councillor Amina Ibrahim, Noel Park Ward. Matt White, Councillor for Tottenham Central. Luke Holly Harrison, Crouch End. Councillor Alex Worrell, Stroud Green. Reg Rice, Councillor for Tottenham Hill Ward. Thank you. And Vice Chair of the Committee. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Um, if I can ask the officers present to introduce themselves, please starting from my left. Principal Committee Coordinator at Larkin's meeting. Um, Aisha Zinsek, Democratic Services and Screening Manager. I'm Bob Walker, uh, one of the legal advisors of the committee this evening. Um, I should note that I am stepping in in part for Matthew Barrett, the council's in-house lawyer, um, who will introduce himself shortly, um, but who will be joining the meeting remotely. Um, I'm primarily here to assist with any procedural or constitutional issues which may arise and to back up in the event of any technical issues. Um, and Mr Barrett will be on hand to deal with any specific legal uh, issues relating to the application before members this evening. Hello, I'm Rob Shasovsky, Assistant Director for Planning, Building Standards and Sustainability. Robbie McNocker, Head of Development Management. Uh, Philip Elliott, Principal Planning Officer. James Dorr, Planning Consultant, Assistant Harrogate for this application. Richard Truscott, Design Officer. Suzanne Kim and Change Officer. Stefan Pietzak, Principal Transport Planning Officer. Bob McIver, Head of Building Control. Thank you. Um, there are officers in attendance virtually and they will introduce themselves when relevant. Uh, so we're on to item one. Um, this meeting is being recorded. All registered speakers should be aware that they will be recorded for live or subsequent broadcast via the Council's internet site or by anyone attending the meeting. Item two, the planning protocol. Uh, members and speakers are requested to note the information set out at item two on the agenda. And we are now on to apologies. Apologies for absence have been received from councillors George Dunstall and Yvonne Say. Councillor Amina Ibrahim is present as a substitute. Welcome, Councillor Ibrahim. Um, there are no items of urgent business. Do members have any declarations of interest? Councillor Ibrahim. Um, so I would like to declare a uh, personal interest in item eight in consideration of one of the objectors. I'm, I hold the Arsenal Football Club membership and am a member of IESA Arsenal Independent Supporters Association. I will be voting on this item and would like to place on record that I will be considering the planning decision at this meeting with an open mind and have taken into account all relevant material planning considerations. Thank you, Councillor Ibrahim. Councillor Bevan. I would like to declare a personal interest in item 8, repeating what is in my register of interest that I received and then donated some Spurs tickets to the Guns N' Roses concert. I would also like to declare a further personal interest in item 8, that I'm a member of the residence consultative group. I will be voting on this item and to place on record that I will be considering the planning decision at this meeting with an open mind and have taken into account all relevant 
material planning considerations. Thank you, Councillor Bevan. So we're now on to item six, uh, which is the minutes, and we will consider the minutes um, at the next meeting. So we're on to item seven, which is the planning applications, um, and item eight is um, the application we are discussing tonight, which is High Road West, London, N17, pages one to 552. Um, the recommendation is to grant. I would like to confirm with the committee's agreement that the committee will allow four speakers in relation to this item. Is this agreed? Thank you. So I'll now hand over um, to the officers who will introduce this application. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a brief introduction to this item um, for members um, before I hand over to the case officer, Philip. The comprehensive redevelopment of High Road West has long been a council ambition, which has led to the adoption of the 2014 master plan. This was followed into the site allocation NT5 in, in the top 2017 Tottenham Area Action Plan, which enshrined us into planning policy. The scale of the development provides substantial benefits and delivers on a large number of planning policy ambitions. These include improvements to health and well-being of the Love Lane residents through estate regeneration and comprehensive placemaking, which will lead to improvements to the area identified to be in deprivation. The provision of 500 social rent homes with reprovision of Love Lane estate rent levels an uplift of over 250 homes above the existing number of social rent council homes on the Love Lane estate, up to 2,929 high quality sustainable homes, including 35% affordable homes by unit, 40% by habitable room, between 7,000 and 41,000 uh, gross internal of commercial community leisure floor space, including a new library and learning centre, a minimum net increase of 240 full time equivalent jobs once operational and a further 93 full-time associated supply chain jobs, a new public park, public square and pedestrian and cycle routes, improved connectivity to White Hart Lane Station, 1,200 construction jobs, 1,200 construction supply chain jobs, up to 267 million of gross value added to the economy every year during construction, and between 22 million and 110 million of gross value added in perpetuity, a new district energy centre connecting to area-wide network, and enhanced biodiversity across the site. It creates some policy conflicts and negative impacts, including less than substantial harm to heritage assets, potential daylight impacts to neighbours, potential for equalities impacts due to the loss of business space, the temporary impact of residents relocating. The approach to compliance with environmental impact assessment regulations requires the worst case scenario to be assessed to fully consider the environmental impacts of the development. So as decision makers, you must be mindful that these impacts could occur, but the development is unlikely to produce those impacts in all respects. The officer's report sets out the balance of benefits far outweighs the negatives, and once the appropriate decision framework is followed, officers find that recommendation is for approval. Councillors must work through the same decision-making framework in their own minds, having heard the full suite of speakers this evening, and must be mindful that a policy conflict does not mean the proposal is unacceptable, provided that the overall proposal offers greater benefits than disbenefits. Again, as assessed through the proper decision making framework. I'll hand over to Philip to talk you through the development. Uh, so firstly, I just wanted to draw members attention to the addendum issued this afternoon, which includes additional objections from Tottenham Hotspur Football Club, uh, the Met Security Advisor and other interested parties. The Council has responded to those objections in the report and made clarifications and corrections to aspects of it. Um, there is an error on page 66 of the report pack in table six, uh, line two. Sorry. Line two should read social rent with 500 homes and 1,730 habitable rooms, which is 23.6% of the total. Line three should read shared ownership uh, 416 homes and 1,164 habitable rooms, which is 15.9% of the total. Uh, we have also received another objection from uh, the club, Tottenham Hotspur Football Club, relating to crowd flow matters, which missed the publication of the addendum. 
this has been reviewed by the Council's independent Crowdflow advisor, who believes the points have already been addressed. Further correspondence has been received from the Met Security Advisor, which states that they have no objection to the proposed development per se, but highlight the need for the Crowdflow arrangements to be shared with the club and the British Transport Police and Emergency Services for comment. This is covered by conditions and obligations in the report. So uh, this is an application for outline and full or detail, detail planning permission at the site known as Hyrule West in Tottenham. The outline uh, part of the proposal is shown on this image in blue to the east of the railway line with the full or detailed part, also known as plot A, shown in red to the west of the tracks at the southern end of the site. The outline element of this hybrid application includes the demolition of most buildings across the site, albeit with the retention of some listed and locally listed heritage assets to create a new mixed use development, including uses such as uh, residential, commercial, business and service, leisure, community uses and sui generis uses. Uh, this is along with the creation of a new public square, a park and associated access, parking and public groundworks. The full or detailed element of this hybrid application includes the demolition of 100 Whitehall Street and Whitehall and Tenterden Community Centre and the construction of new buildings of five to six storeys containing 60 new affordable homes and open space. In the outline proposals, the buildings would be a range of heights and include tall buildings. Up to 2,869 new homes are proposed, in addition to the 60 homes proposed in plot A and at least 35% of the homes would be affordable, which is 40% uh, by habitable room. At least 7,225 square metres of commercial, office, retail and community uses are proposed, which include a library and learning centre. The proposed public park would be a minimum of 5,300 square metres and the public square would be a minimum of 3,500 square metres in size. Uh, other landscape, public realm and pedestrian and cycle routes are also included. So outline applications allow for a decision to be made on the general principles of how a site can be developed. Uh, outline permission is granted subject to conditions requiring the subject subsequent approval of reserve matters applications. Reserve matters are the aspects which are not included in this outline application. In this case, the matters reserved for later determination are those of layout, scale, appearance, landscaping, and access within the site. Reserve matters applications will come forward with each phase and will provide the full detail of each building. Uh, members may remember this approach from recent applications at Clarendon Square. Uh, the reserve matters process allows for further scrutiny from interested parties and members uh, as and when uh, these applications come forward. So this the site is located within the North Tottenham uh, to the west of the high road. Uh, the borough boundary with Enfield is located, located nearby to the north. Uh, immediately to the east of uh, the site is the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium and its associated redevelopment. Uh, the existing site is split by White Hart Lane. So the south of White Hart Lane is the Love Lane Estate uh, and the station and the railway line. Beyond this to the west is Whitehall and Tenderton Community Centre. At the high road frontage is Coonscroft Library and a row of commercial units that include Tottenham Health Centre. To the north of White Hart Lane, there are a mix of industrial and commercial spaces, as well as statutory listed buildings. There are also other locally listed buildings within the site. The main industrial areas are the Peacock Industrial Estate and Carberry Enterprise Park. Uh, the west of the site to the north is dominated by the Goods Yard, which is a cleared site with permission for a mixed use development. And the northern end of the site is occupied by the BM out of town style shopping store. This site is otherwise known as the depot and also has permission for redevelopment. Uh, this next slide just identifies some of those key points of interest across the site and shows the largely commercial, business, and industrial uses to the north with the local authority residential uses to the south. <laughs> Uh, 
Uh, this slide provides some images of the existing condition of uh, these locations. It shows the character of the housing estate to the south with the tall tower blocks, um, the new White Hart Lane station, the heritage assets along the high road and White Hart Lane, uh, the character of the industrial and warehousing to the north, the large out of town shopping centre and images of the Cannon, Cannon Road housing development to the north of the site. Uh, just on heritage assets, the Grange on White Hart Lane and 819 to 821 High Road are Grade 2 listed buildings located within the site. There are also several statutory and locally listed buildings within the local area along the High Road and along White Hart Lane. Um, the, the site includes the locally listed buildings along the High Road between Brereton Road and Moselle Place that would be demolished as part of the proposals. Uh, so, just to touch on the deferral from the March committee, this this application was deferred at committee in March due to uh, very late submissions objecting to the pro proposals. Uh, more time was needed to review the points raised, especially as some aspects uh, such as heritage impacts and impacts on crowd flow were highlighted uh, as possible areas of challenge. Um, so these were taken away and considered. Uh, the main issues that uh, that were raised related to crowd flow impacts, heritage impacts and the assessment of these, uh, flexibility and um, which may prevent uh, legitimate, legitimate assessment, uh, conflict with the Tottenham Area Action Plan and the Hyrule West Master Plan Framework, uh, B2 and B8 use is not being included, uh, issues around phasing um, and issues around employment and community uses, job losses and public transport and healthcare provision. Uh, this pre presentation will uh, seek to respond to um, a lot of these issues. Just touch sorry, just touching on um, a couple of those key issues. Crowd flow has been reviewed and a new study was issued which shows that flows would not only be safe, but the proposed area should function more effectively on event days in the end scenario. Uh, additional heritage analysis has also been carried out which has gone into more detail on impacts on each individual asset to help officers carry out a balancing exercise. The harm identified is considered to be outweighed by the substantial public benefits of the scheme. So the key local plan policy relevant to the application is the site allocation NT5, uh, which is in the Tottenham Area Action Plan. Also of note is the Horeb West Master Plan Framework. Uh, the policy and the framework identifies how development within the area should come forward. Uh, the site also falls within a tall building growth area and is partly within the North, North Tottenham Conservation Area. Areas around the High Road and White Hart Lane are within an archaeological priority area and sections to the North of White Hart Lane are within an area of open space deficiency. Parts of the site also fall within flood zone two due to the culverted Moselle running beneath areas around White Hart Lane. So the NT5 site allocation calls for a master plan comprehensive development to create a new residential neighbourhood and leisure destination for London. The allocation calls for a new high quality public square, an expanded local shopping centre and an uplift in the amount and quality of open space, as well as improved community infrastructure. The comprehensive nature of this development, which occupies the majority of the site allocation, would be a significant step forward in progressing the ambitions of the council and the community to tackle social and economic barriers by providing a large number of good quality affordable homes, job opportunities and training and uh, community and leisure facilities. I won't go through the public benefits of the proposal again, as Robbie sort of touched on these in his introduction. Um, but they're listed there. So on estate regeneration, a significant part of the proposals uh, is the regeneration of the Love Lane estate. The proposals will provide a light for light replacement of existing affordable housing and the right to return for social rent households. The regeneration of the estate complies with the Mayor's Good Practice Guide to Estate Regeneration as well as London Plan Policy HA. 
The consultation with residents uh, that was carried out complied with the key principles set out by the mayor's guidance and within the and was within the site allocation um, in terms of early engagement and feedback. A resident steering group has also been established and a ballot was undertaken with a majority of residents voting in favour of the proposals. And the redevelopment of the estate allows for the opportunity to bring forward uh, a significant quantity of affordable housing. To the south of White Hart Lane, the scheme would deliver 40% affordable housing by unit. The proposals would deliver 500 council homes as well as intermediate housing in the form of shared ownership and shared equity. The new, home, the, the new homes would be built to high quality standards and would have the same access to amenity and play spaces as market housing where blocks are mixed. The applicant has submitted an initiative scheme based on the parameters which would deliver 2,612 homes. This figure for total numbers of homes uh, in the initiative scheme uh, shows that it would deliver just under 1,000 affordable housing units. So the indicative uh, phasing for the proposals indicates that a large uh, proportion of affordable housing would come forward in the early phases uh, to the south of White Hart Lane. The first phase, which is the detailed element of the scheme, would deliver 60 council homes and enable uh, some of the Love Lane residents to move into that new accommodation. Uh, the phases, as touched on before, would also deliver those 500 council homes as well as intermediate forms of affordable housing. So the outline proposals include an initiative master plan that shows how buildings could be accommodated within the development. The master plan delivers on the site allocation requirements by providing a large part to the north and a civic square to the south of White Hart Lane. It proposes a variety of commercial and business uses at ground floor level around areas uh, with more activity with residential uses above. The taller buildings are located to the west of the master plan away from the heritage assets along the high road. The proposals broadly accord with the principles in the high road west master plan framework by providing a north south connection through character areas and a sequence of places that increase density and activity. Workplaces, community facilities and different types of housing and open spaces are all linked and interconnected through the master plan. The proposals will enable better links to the station and safeguard the potential pedestrian route to the west of the tracks to the north of the master plan. Uh, it also includes the library and learning centre on the high road, uh, which would be at the heart of the civic square. The public realm uh, would also be improved throughout the site. Um, and where it connects into the wider area. The comprehensive nature of the proposals uh, seeks to reinvigorate the high road through this additional activity and range of uses centred around generous open spaces. The range of uses should uh, enable a diverse employment offer and a varied place that provides for all groups, families and businesses. Uh, this image just shows the illustrative master plan and key features such as uh, building heights, um, the library and learning centre uh, just to the left of the stadium and the public square to so the north White Hart Lane and the civic square to the south. Uh, heights have been proposed that they are located along the western edge, um, along the railway line and away from the more sensitive locations and heritage assets towards the high road and along White Hart Lane. Uh, this image shows the staircasing of building heights in the initiative master plan, which gradually move up towards the western edge. Some of the listed and locally listed buildings are shown in blue, um, and that image just shows that um, in terms of sort of scale and built form, the proposed uh, initiative buildings would uh, reflect those heritage assets. Uh, so the next few slides just give an indication of the potential quality of the public open spaces and their benefits. Uh, Peacock, Peacock Park to the north of White Hart Lane would form the heart of, new, of the new development. Um, 
the initiative proposal show this as providing a series of green spaces that are activated by commercial, residential and other uses in the surrounding buildings. The spaces will incorporate play for a variety of age groups as well as green infrastructure. Um, so this is an initiative view from the top of Peak Park looking south towards White Hart Lane. It gives an impression of the potential activation and variety that would be provided to residents. The initiative master plan allows for Moselle Square to function as a multi-use civic space that is activated by retail and leisure uses as well as the library but it also has sufficient space to host play, markets and community events. It also has a dual purpose on days when events are being hosted at Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. Um, its layout and scale provide a direct route to White Hart Lane Station, which allows crowd flows to move between the station and stadium more effectively. Now this image just shows the potential for the, the space to provide play similar to Examples of Granary Square or uh, Wolfenstow Town Hall. Uh, it also shows that the ground floors of the illustrative buildings uh, could provide activation onto the square um, and activity. Now these next two images just give an impression of how Moselle Square would operate firstly in the daytime on non-event days. Uh, but again, the potential activation play in an event space can be seen. And this is the same image at night time, uh, just showing how the activation provides safe overlooked spaces into the evening. The next two in images indicate how these spaces could function effectively on event days. So this first image shows a view from the high road looking west through Moselle Square uh, towards the station. And uh, on event days, uh, and this just shows um, an image from Tottenham Hotspur Stadium looking northeast. Shows how uh, shows that direct direct route for crowd flows. Obviously, when the the high roads closed off uh, just before an event. Um, and finally, this is a, an image along White Hart Lane, um, which shows the Grange in the forehand, just to the left of the image. So whilst the proposals were for large open spaces through the park and Civic Square, there would also be a variety of amenity spaces uh, available only to residents at podium and roof level. This slide indicates where the different types of amenity would be located as well as the location of green roofs. The play strategy will allow for doorstep play as well as play on the way and a quick play in the larger open spaces. Uh, the podium gardens um, Sorry, this slide shows the size of the podium level amenity spaces in comparison to the associate buildings. It also shows the expected amount of roof level amenity spaces providing private amenity away from those public open spaces. The podium gardens within the illustrative scheme show generous spaces that allow for play as well as relaxation in private space that is located away from the livelier spaces beyond the building. Just a bit on the aspects. 65 of the homes across the illustrative master plan achieve dual or quad, and all three and four bedroom homes have dual or core aspect with no north facing aspect homes being proposed. to the rear historic buildings on the high road in the northern section of the site. Uh, although um, and will offer a desirable outlook. Uh, that will also be assessed with each reserve matter submission and as further plot testing uh, the number of homes which will last or so the outline submission seeks approval for several control documents, which include matter plan, design code and the diversification. This slide shows the maximum extent of the 
parameter plans in a dotted blue line. The maximum expense would not be possible to be built out because of the limits and restrictions within the other control documents. The maximum expense allow a degree of flexibility that enables future uh, reserve matters applications to bring forward the most ideal solution for the site without needing to amend those parameters. This image shows the applicant's illustrative scheme within the maximum parameter extents, which gives an indication of how the control documents work together to restrict and limit the scale of development. The image also shows how different architectural approaches will be used to ensure the things proposed at reserve matters stage deliver aspects of the allocations, just being heritage sensitive and residential approaches where this is relevant. Uh, the design code sets out approaches and guidelines that must be followed when developing detailed proposals at the reserve matters stage. It outlines where certain aspects must and should be in order to ensure approaches that are adhered to whilst also allowing for inversion and flexibility. Other code could be employed alongside the parameter plans to deliver an acceptable form of development. And in this example, it identifies that the buildings within Block D must have clear visual separation and how this can be represented. Uh, the last control document um, is the development specification, which identifies the minimum and maximum forces. The development zone. Uh, so these next few slides just explain how the control documents work um, uh, with the considerations to restrict and limit uh, development in the parameters. This is an example of zone two, uh, which includes block B and C. We're on Brereton Road to the south of the site. Um, so this first image just shows that you, you begin with that development zone. Uh, then the parameters set up minimum distances between buildings and the plot extent. You then have the parameter plan to identify maximum heights of the different parts of each plot. Then the development specification identifies the uses within the building. Uh, the, the, the development specification also identifies the minimum and maximum floor spaces of those uses within the building. Uh, this image showing how this control document would prevent the maximum parameters being built out. The design code then starts to identify where taller elements must be located and identifies where podium amenity spaces are required. It also requires buildings to limit impacts on daylight sunlight, overshadowing uh, and uh, on views. Beyond the uh, control documents, the buildings would also have to ensure they comply with policies relating to wind, residential quality and again on daylight sunlight. This further uh, limits the, the built form. Buildings also need and the built form uh, to improve residential quality. Now, finally, there's an ongoing was a specific requirements for this particular development related to heritage impacts that requires the form facing uh, the, the high road and conservation area to be sympathetic in terms of scale, uh, and it also identifies the need to protect the well established trees along Burton Road. So just moving on to uh, the quality review panel, uh, they were broadly supportive of, of the proposals and were encouraged by the emerging architecture and the illustrative plan. They did raise concerns about density, uh, the delivery of park and the exact size and scale of the review was detailed at and reviewed at reserve matters stage where there would be further scrutiny of these elements. And in terms of the park, um, it needs to be acknowledged that 
in large regeneration schemes, everything cannot come full at once, but the applicant is proposing to contribute to improvements in Bruce Castle Park to partner by the gates for this in the interim uh, before the park is delivered, as well as provide meanwhile uses and strategies which are stored. Uh, in so this next piece is going to touch on the detailed element of the scheme, um, which relates to so referred to as plotting. Uh, this is the only element that sits to the west of the railway line. Uh, these particular image, images just show the existing community centre, um, as well as the residential properties, parking, uh, boundary trees and bin stores. So uh, two new buildings are proposed of five to six storeys located next to existing residential buildings. Um, the buildings would provide 60 homes, 48% being family sized and all to be council homes, which will enable residents to move off the Love Lane estate. The buildings would be constructed of a pallet consisting of uh, several types of red brick uh, with different mortar colours, different red mortars, uh, with green and pink accents around uh, the doors and windows. Uh, these uh, material choices have uh, been chosen to reflect the surrounding context, uh, particularly the sort of palette that uh, is shown on the Grange. Uh, the colouring also is uh, a way of, is used for wayfinding and identifies entrances and elevations and floor levels. So this image just shows the suite of materials on the communal entrances. Uh, which provide detailing and interest to the facades. Uh, these CGIs show the eastern elevation of the building on approach from the west along Whitehall Street, uh, as well as a communal entrance and indicative views of uh, the internal communal environment um, and core levels. So this image shows a view looking southeast between the new buildings, showing the landscaping and play proposed within the site. Uh, this is just a larger image of the one shown before that shows uh, that view along Whitehall Street looking uh, west. Uh, this uh, shows looking east along Headcorn Road shows how the building would integrate with existing street trees and the wider estate to the west. Again, the front doors and activations of the street is shown. This image from the railway line uh, looking northwest then gives an indication of how the buildings would introduce front doors and natural surveillance to the streets, and it shows the high quality landscaped areas between the buildings. Uh, due to the Operation and neighbouring buildings' primary windows face away from the development, and officers consider it would sit comfortably in its plot. Uh, daylight and sunlight impacts would be acceptable, and the landscaping and streets would improve the public realm. So moving on to other matters, uh, there have been some queries about rent levels, rent levels and service charges. Um, it has been agreed that charges for existing Love Lane residents would be set at no more than 10% above the rent for an equivalent property on the estate. Uh, it is expected that any increases would be offset by other savings, such as those on energy bills. Uh, the impact on education services has been assessed and the proposals would not require additional educational infrastructure, given the existing supply and capacity already in the local area. On health provision has been accounted for in nearby permissions. However, Tottenham Health Centre's services must be reprovided before uh, that building is demolished. Uh, furthermore, if the health centre proposed within the Northumberland Development Project does not come forward, the scheme would provide for any uplift needed to compensate for this. And in line with uh, London Clam, 90% uh, of the new housing would be accessible and adaptable where the other 10% would be wheelchair accessible. 
Um, so just moving on to representations, a, a number of objections have been received with the main areas of objection relating to loss of business, scale and density, impacts on heritage assets, amount of community facilities, equalities impacts, crowd flow and traffic and parking. The previous pages have touched on uh, some of these considerations, um, particularly to do with scale and density and the amount of community facilities um, by, by detail in the public purchase. Uh, the next few slides will just sort of touch on these other aspects. So the proposal seeks to demolish and redevelop the site of several businesses along the high road, uh, White Hart Lane and within the Peacock Industrial Estate and Carberry Enterprise Park. Uh, within the proposals, new commercial units and spaces would be provided that would offer the opportunity for businesses to remain in the area. An obligation will require the applicant to submit a strategy for business relocation, which engages fully with all affected businesses, um, maximises relocation options within the site or locally, and provides support to businesses whilst also minimising disruption and involving fair negotiation. Uh, planning obligations would also secure the provision of affordable workspace and the scheme would provide and support a number of uh, jobs in the construction phase as well as um, provide an uplift in employment when completed. Um, the proposals are in general accordance with the aims and objectives of both the site allocation and the master plan. Uh, the scheme seeks to bring forward the majority of the regeneration areas set out in policy NT5 in a clear and comprehensive manner, which was what was originally envisaged in the High Road West master plan. Uh, several of the proposed buildings are taller than the master plan identified, but permissions elsewhere within the site have accepted this evolution. Um, the proposals would provide a residential density capable of delivering the proposed affordable housing, the public open space, new pedestrian cycle links and new commercial and community floor space. Uh, these benefits are considered to outweigh any deviation from uh, the Higher West Master Plan framework. And just a note there, just to uh, add that B2 and B8 uses have been added to the description of development, but they're also included in the um, development specification uh, in the original submissions. So the officer report, including the addendum, provides an accurate assessment of the heritage impacts of the proposed development. Uh, the harm identified to them has been described in the report and balanced against the public benefits of the scheme when making the recommendation. In this case, the impacts on designated heritage assets subject to design detailing is the potential to result in an upper level of less than substantial harm. However, it is considered that this harm has been clearly outweighed by. This is a staff announcement. Can, can they come to the office? That's uh, to the office. Thank you. In, in this case, the impacts on designated heritage assets uh, subject to design detailing has the potential to cause an upper level of less than substantial harm, which we consider that this harm has been clearly outweighed by public benefits of the proposed development. Uh, as I also mentioned that as reserve matters come forward, there will also be the opportunity for further scrutiny of the individual buildings, which is expected to reduce any identified harm. Uh, Whilst the, just onto the qualities, whilst the proposal would result in some negative impacts in relation to existing businesses and communities losses, as well as associated job losses and the loss or displacement of existing residents. Um, when taking into account the proposed mitigation, such as the business relocation strategy, uh, the landlord offer and the development phasing strategy, along with the benefits brought about by the provision of high quality new homes, including accessible and affordable homes, the provision of new jobs during operation and construction, the improved public realm and access and security improvements. Uh, when all these factors are considered, the proposal is considered to result in an overall beneficial impact, 
once complete on the general population and identified priority groups. So just to pick up on Crowdflow, um, the studies and independent peer review uh, that the Council has commissioned have concluded that at least equivalent queuing provision as existing would be provided during construction and when the development is completed. The interim and end scenarios would not expose uh, any spectators, employees or members of the public to a greater level of risk than what is currently in place. Uh, Crowdflows would also be reviewed by key stakeholders such as the Safety Advisory Group or SAG as part of each Reserve Matters application. And um, on top of that, the club will also uh, have event management plans in place to deal with uh, each specific event. Uh, this slide just identifies the end scenario uh, to the right and also uh, potential interim scenarios during construction. Uh, essentially, the conditions and obligations that uh, in the officer report would ensure that um, the new study that are produced uh, map Uh, the proposed scheme improves connectivity and a new public square that would provide a direct link from White Hart Lane Station to the Tottenham Hotspur Station. Parking can be accommodated within the site and the surrounding road network uh, in line with requirements. Uh, Aaron Gay Cycling Complain uh, have uh, Ejected to the scheme, but have now removed the option um, given that we have added planning conditions and obligations which address their concerns. Uh, the proposal would also contribute to improving cycling in the area uh, for a section 106 obligation towards the facility and protecting facilities along the high road from Seven Sisters Station to the boundary of Enfield. Uh, the scheme would result in a relatively small and manageable increase in vehicular trips, which subject to the uh, recommended conditions and obligations would be acceptable. And an assessment of the likely cumulative effects, including taking account of the likely public trips, it was measures. Uh, the development would deliver significant biodiversity enhancements through the delivery of new public and the provision of a new public park, together with extensive tree planting and greening. Um, the developer has gone above policy requirements. For example, they've exceeded whole life carbon targets by meeting LETI guidance targets, and they have undertaken a BRIAN community's Prius, and its certification is secured by condition. This integration then assesses sustainable design. Overall, it's considered that the proposal accords with the development plan and will continue to seek uh, opportunity to further reduce months of reductions as future as applicants. Um, this is just a list of the heads of terms which largely secure those public benefits that Robbie touched on in his introduction. Um, Obviously, the list is extensive and both the financial and non-financial contributions that the scheme would secure are you know, substantial and outweigh any harm resulting from the development. And uh, just lastly, um, just to touch on the scheme, similarly the poor scheme and they state that public benefits clearly and convincingly outweigh any harm to uh, in particular, heritage assets. Uh, so that concludes the presentation. Obviously, the recommendation is to grant planning permission subject to section 6 legal agreement, but it's uh, stage two uh, once an approval. Thank you. Chair, um, um, thanks for people who are on here, we'll be able to hear the um, very opening lines of your presentation, if you wouldn't mind just um, covering the events again. OK, sorry. Uh, 
So the addendum issued this afternoon includes additional objections from Tottenham Hotspur Football Club, uh, the Metro Advisor and other interested parties. Um, the Council has responded to those objections in the report and made uh, clarifications and corrections to error on page 66 of the report in table 6. Uh, line 2 should read social rent with 500,000 rooms, which is 23.6% of the total. And line 3 should read shared ownership. 406 homes and 1,164 habitable rooms, which is 15.9% of the total. Uh, we have also received another objection from the football club relating to outflows, which missed the location of the addendum. This has been reviewed by the council. that no objection to the proposed they have no objection to the proposed development per se but highlight the need for the crowd flow arrangements to be shared with the club and the British Transport Police and emergencies of a comment this okay so any clarification questions Thanks. Um, yeah, I've got uh, a couple of very brief, quick clarifications and slightly uh, more detailed questions. So, first of all, on uh, apologies. Um, so, first of all, on page three of the pack. Uh, we talk about a minimum uh, of an increase of 240 full-time equivalent hosts being delivered by this scheme. Uh, I'd like to ask how that figure was calculated, and and if you, the response could could in 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 in, addre in addressing that could could give us some confidence of how uh, sh show us how we can be confident that that will actually be delivered uh, ultimately. Um, then on page four. Um, uh, we're talking about workspace provision, and we're talking about um, uh, relocating businesses uh, with the city state. And I how these uh, how how far they're in to be within the vicinity of the site. So then. Um, I wanted to ask something about the reserved matters. Obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to hear that, for instance, details about uh, aspect are considered reserved matters and will be considered. So tonight, were we to approve this uh, outline application, we would not be commi committing ourselves to the numbers of uh, um, single aspect dwellings um, shown in the illustrative uh, uh, diagram on page one, 191 of the pack. But what I can't see in the reserved matters is anything um, referring to uh, the use of of um, the, 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 the various floor spaces in the in the uh, proposed development. And then um, we've got some quite wide kind of um, uh, leeway within the, uh, uh, the the proposal. For instance, on page 57, uh, we're talking about uh, between zero and a thousand square meters of health healthcare floor space. Um, we're talking about between zero and 2,000 square meters of nursery provision. Um, uh, we're talking also about somewhere between a 2,250 square metre loss and a 15,250 square metre gain overall in community and leisure floor space. Uh, so I, I suppose my question is, first of all, um, uh, if the use, what, what, the, what the buildings are going to be used for 
isn't part of the reserved matters, does that mean that we're giving up our, our right tonight, were we to approve this application, to uh, um, make a decision on, on how much, whether we want any nursery provision within the site or whether we want any healthcare floor space or whether we want an increase overall in community and leisure floor space. And I'd, I'd also note that uh, on page uh, 62 of the pack in uh, for paragraph 4.39, um, uh, we're talking about, it, the, the, it says is the benefits for the proposed development, including substantial uplift in housing, community and leisure uses, and open space public rail enhancements and the quantum of high quality replacement commercial floor space that could exceed existing is considered to outweigh the loss. Therefore, I'm, I'm wondering or I'm, I'm slightly concerned that we might, might be being asked to consider a potential balance uh, uh, between um, definite loss and potential gain that we can't be certain of. Uh, uh, and, and I'd like to know how we can have confidence that, that, that the decision we're making on the, on, the, on, the, on the balance between loss of one type of uh, 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 um, uh, 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 provision and, and potential gain is something we can be, be confident that we're making the right decision uh, when it's being left so open. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Councillor White. Yes. Hello, Councillor. Um, I'll just try to address your concern with respect to jobs. Um, the calculation of 240 full time equivalent jobs is derived from a provision of 392 minimum um, jobs based on. Uh, the minimum floor space provision in the lowest employment generating uses that are permissible within this scheme. Um, and it also accounts for the fact that not the business relocation strategy will not result in job losses in, in the majority of cases because they'll be relocated elsewhere um, within the borough. So that's where that 240 full time equivalent figure has been derived. And then just to continue, I believe that the next comment you made was with respect to aspect. Um, and the illustrative scheme is exactly that, it's illustrative. There's a whole whole package of design work that will need to go in before the reserve matters come in. And that'll be subject to further assessment with respect to aspect and quality review and scrutiny from officers and ultimately yourselves um, to, and the aim of that will be to maximise the number of multiple aspect units and as Fred has already described in some cases that won't be possible in this scheme because of con contextual constraints um, but where single aspect units are proposed they tend to be in the locations where they're going to have the better quality outlook over parks and open spaces um, and then in terms of the floor spaces and flexibility in the ranges that are proposed. The purpose for this is to enable the developer to respond to market needs. This will be quite a long construction time, time frame. Um, so that's why we have got these ranges and obviously the parameters set out minimum maximum extent so you tend to want the sort of commercial floor space at the lower ground floor levels. Um, so that sort of dictates a little bit why that flexibility is needed, as well as the fact that some of the community uses are going to be displaced to other locations in the borough. Um, I'm just trying to remember now exactly where you were going with that point. Um, with In terms of your control, you are granted planning permission tonight for the development set in the description and in the control documents, and that does include the ranges of floor space that is set out in the report. So that is what you'll be approving tonight. There will be no scope of reserve matters change to insist on 
uplifts or downlifts of that floor space, but officers are satisfied that even if the minimum floor spaces are provided, there will still be significant benefits coming through from the development. Um, especially in relation to jobs, there will still be a net increase in jobs. And also if you get, if you're in the lower realms of the community use and business floor space, you would naturally get an uplift in housing to uptake that floor space. And that also provides benefits of its own. I'm, I think I've covered most of what you might need to. Yeah, and just a couple of points to add there. Um, for example, health was, was one of the, the uses you were concerned by. Um, although the parameters show a minimum of zero, um, there is an existing health facility on site. Um, there is a planning obligation to re-provide that floor space. Um, so um, that would, would ultimately result in a, a re-provision. There is also an obligation um, to ensure that any uplift in demand for healthcare is um, covered. Um, so that sets out a, a couple of options. Um, there's an existing planning permission for a health facility on the Tottenham Hotspur site, um, which is yet to be developed. So um, that is provided for um, in the area already through that planning permission. If that doesn't come forward, then the applicant has an obligation to provide um, sufficient floor space um, to cover that uplift. And I think um, just to, to add to what James has said, um, it, it can't deliver the minimum in, in every respect. So, um, you know, as James has said, some of the lower um, commercial uses could result in, in an uplift in, in residential. And, and likewise, there are control documents um, that show commercial uses on, on certain ground floor spaces. So um, it would be contrary to that to provide a, a fully residential building in, in some of those areas. So those naturally do deliver um, those commercial spaces and that will um, move between uh, employment spaces, community spaces and leisure spaces. So we're from that we're able to determine that um, there the, the will be public benefits through the delivery of those uses. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, in terms of the definition of the vicinity, that, that hasn't been um, defined yet. Um, I would suggest um, that that will need to be the um, first of all, the, the London Borough of Haringey and then any surrounding boroughs. Um, and that will be something that we can draft into the, um, the more detailed um, 106 when, when that's brought together. Councillor Corley Harrison. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> um, well, First clarification is following on Councillor White's point, which <clears throat> in reference to what Mr McNocker said, if we can't have the minimum, presumably we can't also have the maximum listed, which I think was just over 40,000 square metres of commercial floor space, um, because presumably that would have a knock on impact. I mean, they would it would have to exist somewhere, right? So if you were to maximise all that out, what would what would disappear basically or if you maximized it out would it mean that the parameters within the extant shell outline are maxed on lower levels and then smaller on up so if you could just explain that and then i'm also interested in the the figure of 8.57 hectares that's the total site isn't it including um a yeah you're nodding philip um of that how much is owned by the council? How many hectares is owned as council land or percentage? Of that, how many of the 500 social homes are going onto council land and how many are going on to private land? And then finally, there was a graphic provided by Tottenham Hotspur um, that showed the excellent scheme maxed out with some of the buildings. Um, now in the presentation there was reference to the fact that that couldn't be possible because some of the conditions on one building would have an impact on let's say a, a, an adjoining building which meant that it couldn't be uh, up to a maximum stories or, or a maximum size. So from your perspective as officers is that document that we've been provided by Spurs inaccurate? Uh, 
Um, Pinsler, thank you for that. I'll, I'll just take your question on maximums. Um, so, as, as we've said, um, the environmental impact assessment requires you to model the worst case scenario for in, so in some instances, um, the worst case the scenario would be the maximum. So um, in terms of transport trips and um, things like that. Um, so those are modeled for the purposes of the environmental impacts assessment um, for matters that, that could um, have an impact where the maximum is provided. Um, in terms of the sort of pushing up and down of, of different uses, um, I think you're correct in, in your assessment that um, you could maximize commercial floor space and, and that would reduce residential. That, that is all in play. Um, but there are so many multiple scenarios, we, we, we can't speak to all of those. Um, and um, that's why the, the environmental impact assessment asks us to do what it does to, to assess the worst case scenarios to, to ensure that, that those are acceptable. Um, I think um, on um, I think the next question was on council homes. Um, do you want to go? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so the um, the council in the land to the south for White Hart Lane around uh, the Love Lane estate. Uh, so that's, you know, and Coombs Cross Library as well and uh, Whitehall and Tensidon Community Centre. I wouldn't have the exact hectares of that, but the 500 social homes would all be coming forward on. The 500 social homes would all be on that area of land um, it's. I think it's approximately 2.8 hectares. And just picking up on the Spurs document point, um, I think as, as you picked up, as I explained in the presentation, I, I don't think that what's been put forward in that document could be delivered because of the reasons I explained and uh, going through the parameters in the control documents and the other planning policies that uh, the reserve matters would have to adhere to. Um, Councillor Rice. Th th thank you, Chair. I thought you'd forgotten me. Can I ask, uh, first of all, in terms of uh, the parameter which comes on in this application, whose decision was it to include certain buildings, dwellings, houses, businesses within a, a parameter for decision in respect of development? And, and, and how was that decision made? And what actually engaged people's mind who made the decision? I mean, for instance, there's a suggestion that the business called KMM and chicken clicking or something. Uh, if the line of development was drawn differently, if only lost the space and everything else, then uh, these businesses would not be be uh, involved with, with the planning ar arrangements. So who's, who's, how did we come to this decision? No, uh, just in one term, one thing in terms of reserve matters. I mean, I, I take on the board the conversation has gone on about reserve matters. But what I would be, want to be clear about that this is outline application one, and that the reserve matters which hadn't been outlined for all decisions tonight will come to committee and not decided by the chair uh, and, and senior officers in, in the planning service. It comes to committee again for final decision. I said that from experience in Tottenham Hill. Uh, th just in terms of the heads of terms arrangements. What are the 106 heads of terms? There are some heads of terms for that on the screen, I could not read them. They were so the script was too too much for my poor eyes. And, and so, could you tell me what was the one or six heads of terms as agreed? Thank you, Councillor. 
Um, in terms of your question about the red line of the application site, um, I would just take you to page 55 of the report and um, paragraphs 4.8 onwards. Um, so, um, if I can give you a second. Uh, this sets out um, the Tottenham Area Action Plan's approach to comprehensive development um, and, and notes that that's uh, often in the public interest um, whilst incremental schemes are more easily delivered. Um, it can have limiting consequences on scale layout, layout and viability, whereas um, it notes that um, comprehensive development um, in 4.10 um, can deliver the objectives of the area action plan by securing the optimum use of land, um, proper planning and development, um, and supporting the achievement of, of wider regeneration aims. So um, it, it's the applicant's choice um, where they um, set their red line. But in terms of your consideration of planning policy, um, it is encouraged um, to do what they have done. Um, and the, the policy does state that where necessary, um, compulsory purchase powers could be used um, to assemble land, um, but of course only where necessary. Um, and in terms of bringing reserve matters um, back to committee, that, that's obviously a commitment um, that, that um, we would ascribe to. Um, for a, a development of, of this scale and nature, so um, you, you can be confident that, that that you will be seeing these buildings again. Um, and um, I can if I can just ask um, Philip just to bring the, the heads of terms up on the screen, which you have now. Um, and um, if you would like, um, he could just talk through those again. Uh, yeah, so they're li listed from page four of the committee pack, but also just touching on some of those main ones uh, would be workspace, the 35% affordable housing provision and the associated review mechanisms, um, the 500 council homes, uh, improvements to public realms, streets and open spaces, uh, the delivery of the library and learning centre, uh, which should be uh, designed through an architectural competition, uh, healthcare provision, uh, public park and public square, uh, obligations around public art, transport obligations, uh, employment and skills obligations, and construction partnership and a commitment to consider constructing constructor scheme uh, and connection to the den and carbon offsetting and ultra fast broadband. So that's just a summary of the key heads of terms. Thank you. So, Councillor Over, and then I've got Councillor Ibrahim, Ibrahim afterwards. I just have a two part question um, regarding um, businesses and employment of local residents. So the first part is in relation to the businesses. I understand there have been businesses present within the proposed site for many years and they have raised concerns regarding the scheme um, and relocation. I'm aware from the agenda papers that there will be a business relocation strategy to assist with the re relocation of existing businesses. And it seems from what was said earlier that it's a work in progress um, because there isn't yet, from my understanding, a detailed um, definition of vicinity at this present time. I just want to know whether there's been dialogue with businesses regarding this strategy to ensure concerns are adequately addressed. Just want to get further insight into that. And secondly, in terms of employment of local residents, um, it is stated at page 53 of the agenda pack that the proposal provides the opportunity to deliver on benefits the community have identified through consultations such as job and training. Um, and there will be a net increase of 240 full time equivalent jobs once operational. And I understand from page 61 that it is recommended a section 106 planning obligation to secure the implementation of approved employment and skills plan to maximize opportunities for residents from the development, including during the cons construction phase. However, no figures have been provided as to how many jobs potentially will be set for local residents. Um, so can we get assurance that local residents will be given significant job opportunities and are there any uh, percentage figures of how much that potentially would be? Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, 
In terms of the um, engagement with businesses, um, the applicant team have done um, extensive engagement and consultation. Um, I don't have the, the full details of that in terms of um, what businesses have said and, and how that's um, shaped their approach to business relocation strategy. That um, we have questions just best put to them later. Um, in terms of um, uh, local employment, um, our standard obligations are for 20% um, of construction um, jobs to, to be um, for local people. Um, that isn't set out um, specifically in page nine, but that is um, and will be enshrined in, in the 106. Um, so um, if we can match that with the figure um, for construction jobs, um, that gives you um, the, the potential that, that could go to local people. And just to elaborate on that, yeah, it's a really important point about local jobs and employment. Um, so from the section 106, we then work with the council's in-house economic development team, um, which has a dedicated team looking at section 106s arising from new development to connect them with local jobs. So they have the to, to local people to local jobs. So they have the um, the connections and the expertise to do that. So hopefully that just gives a bit of reassurance on how that works um, through the economic development service. Thank you. Councillor Ibrahim. Um, yeah, so my question is I wanted to explore this issue about the uh, kind of what, what was kind of booted as, as, as a somewhat of a trade off between the um, amount of housing that's going to increase and the and the loss of community leisure floor space. So would an uh, increase in housing or the level of the increase in housing not effectively by definition require there to be at the very least an, in, a, a, an well at the very least for it to remain the same not at the potential which is um, proposed here which could happen and say it will happen which could happen which is a net loss of 2,250 um, square metres so wouldn't um, the applicant consider at least committing to there being no no net loss um, obviously the envelope is quite big with the potential increase however there is um, from what's described in the document a potential decrease so whilst I appreciate what's being said about the increased benefit of the housing surely that goes that would require there to be at the very least um, that the same amount not less Thank you, Councillor. Um, and ju just to clarify, your, your question in relation to no net losses is community uses specifically um, rather than uh, overall commercial floor space. Is that right? So it's it's community and leisure floor space that's referred to in the document. So it it um, talks about a potential net loss of two thousand two hundred and fifty square meters. And and the high end being a potential gain of fifteen thousand, just over fifteen thousand. So my concern is the potential loss in the worst case scenario. So if, if at the very least it stayed the same, rather than there being a potential loss, I'm not saying that that's definitely going to happen, but it would be quite you know to to to, to put. I mean, effectively, we're being put in a position to um, give that big envelope um, and it's not reserved matters. It's something that would be obviously if we were to agree, agree today, there would be the potential for a net loss. Um, I think just worth drawing your attention to page 14 where um, the minimums are all set out in detail. So, um, so the minimum is a potential net loss. Well, if you take um, second from the top, um, indoor sports and recreation, um, that's 500 square metres. Um, then skipping down to libraries, um, that's 500. Um, and then community halls are another 500. Um, so it, it does take you 500 short of, um, of of, of um, no net loss and also I suppose worth noting that um, as I said earlier the planning obligation requires the reprovision of the medical facility um, despite that being a, a zero minimum so 
Um, in terms of uh, the overall picture that those minimums would. Sorry, um, sorry, can I actually read the sentence on it's 4.22 and it says the proposal could therefore deliver between a 2,250 2, square metre GA net loss in community and leisure floor space and um, 15,250 square metre net gain in community floor space. So it actually says that it could deliver a net loss. That's verbatim from the document. Um, yeah, well, as I say, that, that is set out, but when, when you look at the figures, um, there, there is still potential to, to meet that. I, again, I think that's possibly a case of, of worst case scenario. Uh, and it's also worth noting that the Grace Centre, which is on the site, does move yep. to the Irish Centre. So um, that sort of floor space doubles up and, and is used more efficiently. Um, so, you know, as officers, we're, we're satisfied that there is um, adequate um, floor space in, in terms of those uses. I think one other point that's, that's probably just worth bringing members attention to um, on the sort of line of questions of um, controls over floor space and, and what you have in terms of that bigger picture. If, if you go to page 499, um, which sets out um, the conditions, um, that also sets out um, what each reserve matters application should include. Um, so uh, the sort of second bullet point is a planning compliance report um, and uh, that will set out um, certain um, uses and um, points. So, point point two, um, the um, the workspace, housing, retail, and, and delivery. So, as much as um, we have to paint the picture of the worst case scenario, as each phase comes forward and, and we're provided with reserve matters, we will have an ability to to look ahead and, and to understand um, what the bigger picture will be um, and. Um, as much as we're not um, controlling that to at the core of, of those issues, um, there will be an opportunity to influence that and, and to ensure that the development provides um, what what would seems a reasonable expectation of um, of those uses. Thank you. Um, I've got Councillor Bevan. Yeah, just the officer said about the land. My understanding is that as the development progresses, all the land passes three holes from the council to the developer. So even the council housing and the library would not be on three hold council land. It would be transferred three hold to the developer well on the 250 year lease. That That is my understanding. And then when you go through the report, there's actually four density figures mentioned in this report. It starts off at 1200 on page 44, 1400 on page 45, 1650 on page 49, and the final density figure is 2929. Now, to my knowledge, this scheme has been revised three times, and I would ask you to consider whether you consider that to be overdevelopment. And then it mentions viability, and it gives a build cost in this report for the whole scheme of £801 million. Now, I'm assuming those bills costs are already about six months out of date. Now, my assumption is this scheme is probably not viable at the present time. So what would you expect the developers to come back to us and say, we cannot provide this anymore? And then my last point is, I've heard figures banded about that the single aspect units will be approximately 20%. I know someone else has mentioned this, so can you Perhaps give us a bit more information on that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Just to pick up on your, your first point about land ownership, um, I'm not uh, 
familiar with with any kind of arrangement between the council um, and the the developer, um, but, but, but normally kind of land ownership issues aren't a material consideration um, as they can change obviously over time. Um, just ca just carry on please can you just carry on yes thank you chair um yeah i have nothing really further to add just that, it, that there may be an agreement in place between the council and 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 the developer but in terms of a planning consideration you're considering the the application before you and the controls the conditions and the obligations um regardless of who the owner may be from from time to time um we'll come back i'll we'll come back to that in the this question in the applicants section um, so we just on to the question about overdevelopment. Uh, so the question was, do we consider overdevelopment? And no, uh, just reference in my presentation, obviously we feel that the housing numbers and the sort of densities enable uh, the, the the developers to provide those open spaces and the other sort of facilities and public realm, which uh, results in a good quality um, residential, um, good quality homes essentially, and a good quality living environment. Um, Chair, I'm just going to So just on the single aspect point, uh, as we sort of touched on before, we as the RMAs come back, uh, we will assess those again and we'll look at each individual development plot and look at whether the, the single aspect units are uh, inappropriate or not uh, meeting standards. And if they don't, then that application would be refused. And there's the opportunity to obviously improve those numbers. Uh, what they've done so far is just tested it and it's based on a legislative scheme, but when they get into the finer details, they'll be able to improve those um, numbers of uh, dual aspects or multiple aspect units. Thank you. Councillor White. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I take on board what was said in response to, to my question before, that obviously there needs to be some flexibility uh, in, in terms of what because you know, obviously this is a long project, it's going to be delivered over a number of years. We, we, we may, may not be sure exactly what provision of various types we might need. Now, I, I was referring to the, uh, the, 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 the nursery provision and the healthcare provision kind of as an example. Um, but I suppose what, I mean, there are a number of other uh, uh, um, similar things. You know, there's also the, the point made by the quality review panel uh, about um, uh, the importance of the Peacock Park being delivered in order to make the northern part of the scheme a success and concerns because that's in a, in a, in a later part of the scheme, whether that is deliverable. So I suppose overall what my concern is, and, and I don't know how this can be addressed by, by, by officers, but it's, it seems to me that um, we are if we make this decision to approve this outline application tonight, we are kind of abdicating our decision making power. I'm saying that um, we're going to leave the decision over uh, how much employment there, how much uh, uh, provision we have to and rightly for, for them as a, as, a, as a company operating in the private sector. So, largely uh, commercial auntie. So the, 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 uh, um, it's not necessarily going to, I'm wondering where we can get that power to make the decision on planning grounds over um, uh, uh, what what the needs when 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 that becomes clearer uh, at, at the time when those um, detailed applications come forward. So is there a way that we 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 don't uh, um, we don't we don't have to uh, leave um, power to keep 
keep that decision, keep that distance plan. Uh, thank you. Um, so I think taking up the, the question on open space and later, um, um, it was fair for me to come as a to your quality and, and the housing quality, and um, it does go against um, the policies that I, I drew Councillor Rice's attention to earlier. Um, in that this comprehensive approach is supported by policy to, to make the whole together um, and provide those amenities that, that support um, the, this level of development and, and that brings. Um, so, uh, it, you know, it, it's unfair on the, on the applicant to say following the policy on comprehensive development to then ask them to, to do things on the land that they do yet. Um, so that, that's important to bear in point. Um, in terms of the, um, you know, I think I think we've said we said we're satisfied by it. The, the um, we understand the need for flexibility, and I think it's important to bear in mind that um, for this to be a successful development for the developer, it will have to have those um, those those necessary amenities for their residents. Uh, uh, you know, a nursery, um, uh, somewhere for them to um, you know spend time with with other members of the community. Um, you know. Complementary leisure uses, so um, you know their aspirations for for place making will um, influence that. Um, I think probably having um, you know given you several answers on that, it, it is perhaps one best put to the applicant now in, in terms of um, what their aspirations would be and um, whether they would accept any 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 controls on that. Um, so I, I think that's probably all I can say on that at the moment. And just to elaborate on what Mr. McNock has said, um, firstly, the application has to be in accordance with the development plan, which the council sets and the council controls um, uh, and, and consideration of material considerations. So um, the development plan does set out the overall sort of types of land uses and mixes. So the council is in control of, of, of that development plan. And then this application has come forward and we're assessing whether it's in accordance with that development plan um, and material considerations. And the officer report sets out that that um, on the whole, on balance, looking at that, um, it, it's acceptable and we, we recommend approval on that basis. Um, but not only that, um, in addition to the planning policy um, control and planning policy will still apply to future reserve matters as well. Um, as set out um, by colleagues earlier, there's a whole range of the, the different parameter plans and, and mixes and various minima and maxima that have to be applied. So that's that is still um, within the control of us as as planning authority when this is being determined. So there's still quite a significant amount of control for us as the planning authority through planning policy and through future reserve matters. Councillor Corley Harrison. Thanks. Yeah, I just want to um, get some clarity on the figures, the unit figures and the affordable figures. So there's, there's three primary figures shown: two six one two, two eight six nine, and two nine two nine. Two six one two, sorry, two eight six nine and two nine two nine seem to relate to whether it includes site A. Or without site A. So what's two what's the two six one two? Because that figure seems to have been used to calculate the thirty-five percent affordable. Um, just on a point that Mr. McNocker made in reference to uh, page fifty-five, section four point one oh in terms of different landowners, loan landowners and bringing the site forward as a single piece, so to speak. Um, if you can just provide some detail on the existing approved applications, the applications that appeal, how they fit within the master plan. If. You know, Spurs really start building their developments as they are, how that sits within this plan. And similarly, um, there is um, in section 4.11 a sentence which says a planning condition is proposed to allow future planning consents on the site to be incorporated into the master plan and prevent conflicts arising through overlapping planning permissions. 
I don't understand how a condition can be applied to this application that would limit someone coming forward with their own application within the site boundary and doing what they want effectively, so long as it is on balance a benefit. So perhaps if you can clarify that. Uh, and then on the um, calculation of viability, there's a figure that's redacted, which is the compensation cost. Compensation for what? Who is it going to? That's on page 68. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I'll take the first point. This 2612 figure is the illustrative scheme. So those affordable housing uh, numbers relate to the illustrative scheme, which is one way in which the development could come forward in the context of the three control documents. So that's why the 2929 figure is, as you say, that's plus a 60 affordable homes, plus the uh, outline part of the site, which is the 2869 figure. So that's the maximum number within the outline part of the site. Um, moving on to the... Sorry, can I just confirm then, if we went to those figures, there would be an assumption there would be an uplift in affordable homes? Yes, you're correct. And, that, and that's based on the 35% by unit and the 40% by habitable room. Um, in terms of the overlapping permissions and how the existing consents fit within the within this master plan, um, the parameter plans facilitate delivery of those ex extant schemes. So they actually fit within the parameters proposed in this development. Um, and that applies to the depot, goods yard, uh, and the frameworks uh, school resolutions grant. Um, in respect to the planning condition you referenced that tries to capture what happens if any further development goes through, for example, an appeal gets allowed. Um, the purpose of that is to allow the control documents to be amended to facilitate any uplift in the parameters that would be necessary to facilitate incorporating those schemes into this master plan. So I, I hope that provides clarification there. The, the redacted compensation costs uh, relating to sort of uh, the, the compulsory purchase anticipated costs of purchasing homes that the applicant doesn't currently own. Um, hopefully that addresses. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? No, thank you. Okay, so we now move on to the objectors. Um, Paul Burnham, you have three minutes starting now. Okay, hello. Uh, my name is Paul Burnham from Harangay Defend Council Housing. Um, the public benefits of this scheme will not be delivered because the economics of the scheme is based on cross subsidising building new council homes at Love Lane by market sales and the north. But actually Spurs own half of that land and quite a lot of the rest of it is a public park. Then lease are left with very little there in order to subsidise what's happening in the south. So those benefits are going to be, those public benefits are going to be squeezed. That's the danger. We're just looking at quality now. Um, the, the quality review panel, uh, the independent experts, that is, that the council's got, do not support this application. They objected to the excessive density. 1,400 homes became 2,900 homes. The panel find it necessary to ask for a plan on a human scale that safeguards quality of life because they're not seeing that in the plans in front of us today. They also find it necessary to ask Haringey not to house council tenants in blocks with low levels of daylight and sunlight because that's what they think is going to be built here. Again, 
uh, the, the single aspect issue. It's it's a travesty. 927 single aspect homes in the illustrative scheme with external windows facing in only one direction. This is a key quality of life issue. And what's being proposed is in breach of the London Housing Design Guide. These homes include 19 homes at the in the detail part of the application at Whitehall Mews, including three disabled flats. Absolutely, absolutely appalling, really. And then I think um, I'd just like to say about um, the issue of ownership of, of, the, of the land at Love Lane. It's really important and it is a planning issue because it's a question of what control residents have over the homes they live in. So that there'll be council tenants or would be council tenants. The land will be on a long lease to lend to lend lease, as John Bevan described. And the question then is going to be the service charges. We've seen what's going on around those homes. It's going to be a walkway. There's going to be crowds at every event day. There's going to be all kinds of problems and, and Spurs, quite frankly, have refused to pay for it. Who's going to end up paying for it? Those tenants via service charges. And even though they're council tenants, the council won't have the control it has now over the service charges. That's a big problem. Now on to the consultation at Love Lane. You may well be told that everybody now supports demolition. However, this is not accurate. We saw a ballot last year where three quarters of the voters had no secure tenancy and they were asked to vote yes to get one. So this was a vote for the tenancies and not for the merits of demolition. Even so, despite that, only 38% of the voters voted yes. The malpractices of officers collecting votes door to door, making false promises to individuals about rehousing have rightly become notorious. Already promises made for the ballot have been broken. Thank you, thank you Mr Burnham, your three minutes is With the postponement of 360 of the proposed council homes until 10 to 15 years time. Will they be ever delivered? Will they be delivered as council homes? Thank we you. would question that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. OK, thank you. The next objector is Alex Trifonos. Mr Trifonos, you have three minutes starting now. Good evening everyone, my name is Alex Trifonos. Tonight I'm speaking on behalf of my family and many of the business along the high road. I cannot believe that in the year 2022, prime land that belongs to private families and it's been their family home for over 46 years has been put forward for planning approval by the council and land lease. I thought we move forward from all this. I thought that we had learned from the injustice and mistakes of the past, but I guess not. For the past 10 years, we've been told that we do not belong, that our shops, business and homes don't fit in this new development, they don't look right. Right from the beginning of this so-called regeneration, we had council officers telling everyone that our homes and business are going to be demolished sooner or later. How can anyone in this room justify that private land is being snatched from us to create a new library and a community centre? Why can they be incorporated in the council land behind? We always had the library along the high road built on council land, a library that was under threat of closure for many years from this council. We also had a lovely community centre at the back of the Lovelyn estate, which I used to use as a child called Tenterden, until the council decided to close it in the early 1980. Now all of a sudden, the council is trying to promote the idea that it's delivering a new library and a community centre on our land to justify themselves. Why has this council closed existing one? In the past 10 years, this council has spent an average of 220,000 on each of the rest of the high road shop renovating them, while they just spent the last 10 years trying to get rid of us. My message to the committee members is that we have earned the right to remain as part of the Tottenham High Road community. Our objective is consistent with the views of the local community who have been clear that they want to keep the existing historic character of the high road and all the shops and business along there. The shops on the high road proposed for demolition on this application provides full-time employment to over 60 people, homes to 15 families, and the health center to over four and a half thousand residents. The overall job loss in the area is over 690. We have made these points again and again to the council, but have been ignored. We feel like the community 
of Tottenham High Road that's just an inconvenience to be overcome and bought off for the sake of more important and interest. The years of this proposed scheme has cast a dark shadow on our lives and families. The stress, the anxiety, the sleepless nights, the not knowing what tomorrow will bring has affected our everyday life. Our mental and physical well-being would never ever be the same again. No other human being should ever be subjected to this. We have earned the right to be part of this development and remain where we are, not to be demolished. Thank you, Mr. Trafalgar. Can, can you just allow minutes. me one more minute? I'm about, no, to, no, I'm no, about no. to lose everything we have. Please. Just finish your please, sentence, please. Please, please, please just, just give me one more minute. Just finish your uh, sentence. Please. I'm aggravated. I have to come along tonight to justify my busyness and the homes of my family. Then justice is shared by everybody in the Tottenham area. Something Harrogate Council and it's thank developer, okay. nothing. Okay. One so minute. Tonight, tonight you must not let history repeat itself by allowing our land to be taken away from us. Right. Just you. like the Bruce family. Thank you. So and I just thank you, Mr. Half Trifonis. a minute, please. 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 Mr. Trefonis, I have to be fair to everyone. Thank you, Barbara. So well, I'm about to lose my home. My family's time. about to lose their home. We'll right, leave okay. there. Can we move on to Tottenham Hotspur Football Club, please? And that's Farouk. Uh, thank you. I have to be fair to everyone. Could we? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, uh, this is Farouk Tepeyot. I'm the former director of Peacock Industrial Estate. And I'm sorry, going to speak sorry, on sir. behalf of. Just right. Can you, you right? Your time starts now. Your three minutes starts now. Thank you. Stop, 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 stop. Are you speaking on Peacock Estate? Yeah, yeah okay, can you make that clear? Sorry, it's clear. sorry, it's Tottenham Hotspurs football. Thank you. Okay, are you ready? So your three minutes starts now. Thank you. Uh, good evening. I'm Richard Serra, Head of Planning at Spurs. Regrettably, we are objecting this evening on four grounds. Firstly, this application is a departure from the Tottenham AAP and the High Road West Master Plan Framework. These documents were produced by the Council after extensive consultation. Why are they now being ignored? The AAP envisaged a balanced place to live and work and to provide real opportunities for people after the riots. The scheme before you will need to lead to a net loss on site, net loss on site of nearly 300 jobs in a borough with one of the highest levels of unemployment in the country. Employment, as we know, is a key driver of regeneration and improving people's quality of life. The scheme is virtually entirely residential, over 97% of it. So there is simply no meaningful commitment to community leisure or employment uses. It is poorly designed residential at that your own QRP cannot support the current proposals, concluding it would create a generally poor height and overdevelopment. Secondly, the safe movement of people has still not been properly addressed. Over a million people use White Hart Lane Station every year. The Metropolitan Police have objected and as of today continue to object to this scheme on the grounds of safety and security. I should say at this point, unless there's been a further letter today, a third letter that we're not aware of from the Metropolitan Police, Mr Hughes has misled you in saying that they have no objection per se. For this reason alone, you should not be granting planning permission. You have a duty to satisfy yourselves that the scheme is safe and you simply cannot reach that conclusion this evening. Thirdly, the officer reports asks you to set aside all the acknowledged scheme deficiencies and issues that everybody has raised in order to secure GLA funding. According to the officer report, the scheme isn't viable, not even with the 90 million pounds of public subsidy. Obtaining public subsidy should not be the reason to grant approval of a scheme of such poor quality and override so many significant concerns. The level of scheme uncertainty is unprecedented. The scheme benefits inadequate and unclear. The harms unquantified and the crowd flow safety not proven. Fourthly and finally, you are not simply agreeing a first phase of 60 houses. If you approve this scheme tonight, you'll be fixing the maximum heights, maximum floor space and uses of the development within the minimum and the maximum parameters across the entire site. There can be no going back. 
You will have no power at reserve matters stage or through conditions to insist upon more than the minimum floor space is permitted or to change the balance of uses in order to provide greater employment, community or leisure facilities. And as you've heard from officers, the market will not drive the community facilities upwards. The scheme is disrespectful to the aspirations and hopes of our local community, which were enshrined and widely consulted upon in the area action plan. We strongly urge you to refuse this application. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just seeking clarification if you could just bear with me for a moment, please. Right, so um, the next objector is Farouk Tepeyot. Thank you. Um, my name is Farouk Tebiot. I'm here to represent. I'm, I'm the former director of Peacock Industrial Estate, and I'm representing Peacock Industrial Estate and the small traders on the High Road and uh, White Hart Lane. Herringay is the fourth most deprived borough in London and the 13th in the country. Peacock Industrial Estate is a business oasis within a deprived area. We have a unique position. As most of us own the freehold units and some of us have long term leases and we manage our own estate, we generate an income through match day parking. The planning officer's report states that 85 businesses support around 690 jobs. Half of those jobs are on the high road and uh, white art lane and half of those jobs are at Peacock Industrial Estate. The jobs at Peacock Industrial Estate they are highly skilled jobs. They're well paid. They're paid. Most of the jobs are paid well above, you know, London uh, minimum wage. And we are, most of us are self-employed. If you go to page 13 and 12 of the additional uh, addendum, you will see more details about our estate. Now, you need to be aware that the applicant, Despite a warning from the council and the misleading promise from Avni Mehta, who is uh, the senior director of Lentlis, is proposing to scorch to earth the whole estate. You know, they're proposing to demolish all our 30 units, to demolish 85 businesses on the high road and on White Hart Lane and get rid of us. The warning came on 25th of October at the pre-application briefing to the Strategic Planning Committee. The officer's report stated that the loss of industrial land would need to be mitigated by inclusion of a minimum amount of floor space, which they avoided. The misleading promise from Avni Mehta was made on 29th of November to the Scrutiny Committee on record, I'm quoting, quote, they wouldn't be able to provide the exact level but the level of industrial space on the new site would be approximately 30% of the space that the Peacock Industrial Estate currently had, unquote. And what are we getting now? Zilch, we are getting nothing. I also want to highlight the engagement issue. The response of DP9, applicants uh, planning consultant, I mean, which you received a couple of days ago. It's a misleading document. Despite land leases contract provision, I'm reminding the planning officer who hasn't read the uh, agreement. Yeah, uh, go to Article 32, please. There has been no engagement with the estate uh, or business on the high road to address any of our concerns. We went uh, to one public meeting on 31st of January 2019, uh, which was arranged in the uh, Grange House. We protested. There is a YouTube video on it. If uh, the committee members would like to see it, we can show it. We said you need to respect our property um, rights. Mr. Tapia, your time is up now. Now, Thank what you. I would like to say, I, just one sentence, just one sentence. The, not you. individual officers, but the scheme uh, designed by these officers 
is deep down racist and discriminatory. We have been discriminated over the last 10 years. Our, Thank you. We want to remain. And Thank just you. one more. North of, just one more. North of White Hart Lane is privately owned. Tottenham Hotspurs promised 860 homes and we promised 240 homes. 1,100 uh, you. homes you. That's without you. Thank any, you. any Thank from you. public funds. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor Ali. Councillor Ali, can you come up to, find, to the mic, Councillor Ali? Thank you. Well, tell us when you're ready and you have three minutes. All right, Councillor Ali, you have three minutes starting now. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you for, for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, we're in a very difficult situation because we're, I'm one of the three new councillors for this ward and this scheme has come very quickly after the election, so we've not had um, the time that we would have liked to really um, give this some some thorough consideration. However, um, there are four points of concern I'd like to raise um, with the committee today. Um, they should not be seen as formal obje objections, and I'll explain why that's the case shortly. Um, four issues very quickly. So the first issue, is obviously, has been mentioned before, is the, the impact on the, the neighbouring residents outside the red line. Um, it's not been made clear to ward councils as to why the red line arbitrarily ends at Bereton Road. Why not include James Place? Why not include Church Road? There's some logic behind having it that going that way because of the similar type of building design. So interesting as to thinking, but also some of the concerns about the CGI in the committee pack that show the loss of um, amenities to the existing estates on Headcorn Road, uh, mainly the parking spaces and mainly um, the uh, the storage used by the um, groundskeeper on the estate, and also has concerns about the use of access on a very small, narrow cul-de-sac and HGVs, um, you know, navigating that, trying to get delivery down the wrong way. So we are quite concerned about the impact on, on existing areas outside of the red line, like the school, the church, um, the existing businesses that won't be demolished. Um, that's something that I think has not been given really due consideration. There's been a lot of intense conversations with um, residents, but not with the, out, the wider stakeholders. Um, density. Um, I'm led to believe that the tallest building will be 29 storeys high. And I think despite the, I could be wrong, but despite the um, the reassurance that we've been given about the impact they won't have on the high road, we are quite concerned about the, the neighbourhoods outside of the red line, in particular the other side of White Hart Lane, the bungalows on Bufroyd Road, Penhurst Road, Pretoria Road, etc. And I think that's that needs to give us some serious consideration about the character of the area and the heritage of the high road. And also in terms of the issue of density, also amenities, shall I say, is the leisure centre. I'm really disappointed that there's been little conversation between the CCG, uh, Lendlease and the council as to having a clear plan about what happens if the Tottenham Health Centre uh, falls through. I don't want any impact to be given onto neighbouring health centres like Somerset Gardens, which is already oversubscribed, and so there's a different elderly community population than the existing uh, community. So that's really quite a, a failing, I think, on, on, on that part. And the issue of SME businesses, I think we're at a situation where we are taking a cow and we're giving someone a chicken to rent. And I, that's what it feels like. It's really, really wholly difficult to stomach to say we'll take your land, we'll take your property and your business and we'll give you something in return that's not really yours and that Thank you can't you. tangibly own. Thank and you Councillor Allen. Just Thank one you. sentence, Chair, with your permission. Um, ultimately, my our, our, our outcome is that we want to support the residents who voted for this ballot. We don't want to stand in their way. However, we are really concerned that that there needs to be some serious proper consideration, compensation and adjustment for those who are impacted. And that needs to be really fleshed out Thank more you. than what's been offered Thank to you. me tonight. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Councillor Ali. And thank you to the objectors for your contributions. So members can ask questions of the objectors. So have Councillor Corley Harrison first. Thank you. It's a question for Richard, Sarah.
Um, so the question is, uh, obviously you don't support the scheme as it is. It doesn't provide well enough industrial space, commercial space, that sort of thing. In in your view, uh, would you like to see um, a scheme with a reduction in residential units overall to compensate, or would you like to see a bigger scheme, so more floor space? but with the same general number of residential units across it? It's not really <coughs> for the club to dictate or to express a wish, I think, in terms of whether there needs to be more or the same or fewer residential units. I think all we can go on is the analysis and the report, the analysis of QRP, which I think generally suggests that there are too many units, at least in the scheme as currently designed, or at least the design of the scheme doesn't um, doesn't adequately bring forward the quality that you'd expect on a, on a high density scheme. So, um, no, we're not going to sit here and say it needs to be more or less or the same. Um, you know, we would read the analysis as you have in terms of quality of the scheme has been put before you and we don't think it's good enough. Councillor Rice. Yeah, I'd just like to, Mr Farouk, I'm not sure what the last name was. Uh, yeah, my, my concern is your outrage that you said when you made a speech, you said that the Harringay Council and everybody else was racist. I spent 30 years of my life fighting racism in this borough and the, the, for you to come forward in nights such as this and make such outrageous claims against Harringay Council and the, the, and the community live in Harrogate. You know, I think you should actually apologise for making those comments before we apologise now because it's completely outrageous and it should not be allowed to stand. Uh, I can't. Yeah. Now, uh, this scheme has been going on since 2010. And in 2013, uh, counts, uh, planning officers invited uh, uh, certain uh, people to property festivals. They asked for donations. They never came to us asking for donations. We have the means to donate. They held more than 20 uh, meetings, secret meetings with landowners and developers. We own land, you know, we own one third of the land. We are ethnic minority groups. They never included us in those meetings. We were always excluded. They uh, held uh, special uh, planning consultancies where uh, DP9 wrote to uh, Herringay Council around 2015 saying, you know, uh, we should uh, develop the area in highly uh, dense form. We were never asked our opinion in 2014. They dezoned our employment zone from protected employment business zone into normal residential zone because the, in those secret meetings they cocked up all these uh, things. I, the office we we submitted a pre-planning application in 2017, and the officers they belittled our plans and they looked down upon us. Look, I have been in this country for the last 30 years. I, this is my adopted home. Most of us came from, you know, Kurd, uh, from Kurdistan, from Turkey, from Cyprus. So when we see racism, we recognize it. And the officers, there is no ethnic minority officer in the senior team. Helen Fisher, Sarah Lavell, they were all softly spoken but they belittled us. They looked down upon us. They were they held contempt towards us. And I'm not going to apologize it. Um, I'm not going to comment on allegations, but just to make clear, there is a separation in the council between the local planning authority planning officers, the regeneration service, and obviously, in, we also have outside of the council, the applicant, which is lend -Lease. So we'd just like to make those distinctions there, but I'm not going to comment on those allegations. Thank you. OK, I have um, Councillor Bevan and Councillor Warren, Councillor Ibrahim. Yeah, a question to suppose with your experience. I mean, I believe this scheme to be unviable now. 
considering the build costs were probably estimated about six months ago, and we all know what's going on in the construction industry. What would you expect the developer to do in that situation? Would you expect them to come back soon and say, we cannot provide a library, we cannot provide 500 houses because it's all costing so much more? What, what, what actually happens when that situation arises? Respectfully, Chair, I, I'm not sure that's a question really I can I can answer other than to reiterate I think some of the debate that's taken place earlier on about the minima floor space has been incorporated within the application and clearly in respect of I think Councillor Beverly mentioned the library. I think the floor space relating to the library ranges from 500 square metres to 3,500 square metres. So I think if you approve the scheme, you are approving a range of floor spaces for that particular building. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Warren. Thank you. My question was also to the representative from Spurs. Um, you used a phrase, something like unprecedented levels of uncertainty. Um, was that in reference to what Councillor Bevins just sort of alluded to with the construction industry, or is that in reference to um, what we've spoken about, these very wide windows of worst case scenario versus best case scenario? And if the latter, I just wondered, um how you'd kind of come to that conclusion because that's something I've been trying to get to grips with as a relatively was a very new councillor and new member of the committee to what extent are these quite uncertain and wide windows something which are somewhat par for the course for such a large development and to what extent are these quite extreme and unusual thanks I think Chair probably can answer that. I think in, in my experience, at least as a planning professional in 27 years of making numerous outline planning applications uh, from the perspective of working for the club for the last seven years in which we've made a number of outline planning applications, in that experience at least, uh, have never come across an outline application of this scale with so much flexibility built into it. I think it ranges from 60 to 70,000 square metres by indication that is the size of the Sainsbury's on the Thumbland Park on their, their trading floor is about that. So it's, it's 10 times that size, I should say. It's 10 times that size. So have in mind the sort of the sales area for the Sainsbury's on the Thumbland Park. Multiply that by 10 and you have basically the, the range of floor space that is built into this outline application. May just help to put it into context. Councillor Abraham. Yeah, my first question is to um, Paul Burnham from um, Defend Council Housing. And then I've also got a question for Spurs, but I'll do um, Paul's first, if that's all right. I'll let you sit down, Paul. So I, I suppose my question is obviously you're here representing um, Defend Council Housing. And one of the key aspects of this scheme is 500 council homes. And um, I suppose I want to hear a little bit more about your views on that, because that's that's quite, a, I think we'll all agree, that's quite a substantial increase on what was previously, you know, in, in, in the historic proposals, but also that they're council rents and obviously not the classic affordable. So I, I suppose as a representative of an organisation called Defend Council Housing, um, just want to explore that a little bit with you, why you feel um, so strongly um, in order to object a scheme which probably if you look across London has got a, one of the most significant amounts of council housing built into it. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, I think the answer to that really is to look at the look at this, at this at the scheme as a whole. Look how the scheme is working. We've already seen that out of the 500 homes, 309 of them are not going to be built until 10 years to 15 years time because Lendlease, backed up by the council, has put those homes in the, the very last plots, two plots that are going to be developed. So many things can happen in that time. What's the economy going to be like in 15 years time? What's the nature of Lend-Lease's um, business going to be like in 15 years time? All the danger 
as is, questions have already flagged up about what the what what kind of facilities are going to be provided but all the danger is that once the outline once lend lease has got an outline planning application they will turn that scheme around so it delivers more profit for them and that those community benefits don't get delivered including those council homes that's the danger on that the, 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 one could also say look at the overall impact of the scheme 2900 homes the, the, they are going to increase house prices outside the red line area and social people will be socially cleansed those house prices will be uh, um, uh, a hammer a blow to people driving people out of the area then an another point would be about the management of the existing stock uh, um, uh, uh, because that, it, that 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 housing stock hasn't been managed well has it's been managed in order to at some point knock it down and those tenants have not been served well i just like to finally say though on the, the other points you that you make you're quite right to do them it's good that this borough has got a, a, a house council house building program it's good that it's got a hundred percent social rent social rent policy that you played a role in, in in introducing so all that is positive that doesn't mean that this scheme should go ahead it shouldn't in my view um, Councillor Ibrahim, can I just bring Rob Shizovsky in to just clarify something? Thank you. Thank you. Just on the point that Mr. Burnham raised about um, uh, affordable housing being in later phases, as the committee can see and has been explained today, that the detailed phase in the application in front of us today compared to the rest of the outline, the detailed phase is the Whitehall Muse um, social rent homes. So that, that is in detail with us and is, is planned to come forward as the first phase. Um, so that bit, and to be to clarify that point um, that Mr. Burnham raised, I just have to come back on that. And I think Mr. McNocker just wants to come in on something as well. Thank you. Yes, just just to add in terms of um, the housing revision, the, the section 106 requires a percentage of all homes to be affordable. So um, if there is um, an increase, that brings the affordable up with it, um, and that's enshrined in the 106. And each phase must have a viability assessment attached with it. Um, and, and submitted to the council for review. Um, thank you, and I'm glad you clarified that was because that was my understanding of it as well. Um, my my question is to um, Tottenham Hotspur. Um, so um, obviously, um, I am in my questioning earlier. I am concerned about this this quite wide envelope. Um, but I suppose it's not so much the wide envelope because you, you, you know, you, you've, you've been able to explain to us so that we can get it, get the image of what it looks like in in our heads in, in terms of the kind of the wideness of the possibility of 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 how little it could be or how much it could be by explaining the size of of Sainsbury's times ten. I think you said ten. Sainsbury's times ten. Okay, um, but that that isn't how much it's not Sainsbury's by 10 less is it because potentially the reason why the window is so big is because it could be Sainsbury's times maybe seven more in a sense so I suppose am I right in understanding that you, you're not saying that it could be 10 Sainsbury's times 10 less it could be a couple of Sainsbury's less, but in addition, it could be seven Sainsbury's more. If I, if I think I've understood the point, yeah, it, it's it's the range. It's that's the it's the width of the range I was trying to convey. It's it's quite a wide range of maximum minimum floor space in total. Okay, thank you for that. Um, are there any more questions? No. Okay. Thank you. So thank you um, to all of you. So I now move on to the supporters and the applicants to address the committee. I'll start with the supporters. Um, Bill Adouf. You have three minutes, Mr. Starting. No. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Bill Adouf and I live in since 2008 law in, in Mosul House. And I'm the chair of the Love Line Resident Association, and I have been involved in, since 2008. I speak to the community and the care basically in the many years, and we have problem with the repair and then the bad communication in the council. And I had leak in the last year in my kitchen, and it started to smell, and the building it was in really poor condition. 
the market will be need to clean and is the bad sometimes the lift it, it is not working and for a longer time my mom my mom is 80 years old and we live in fourth floor it's impossible for people with the baby on the wheelchair to get around when the lift is not out of service and then of them we need to to scheme to go ahead and the more security because after school people come in to the small and stairs and the play the lifting antisocial behavior will reduce and the new scheme and i went to the 11 park with the some of the other ra the member of the we like what uh, we saw it there was a space business high street accounting and then multicultural shop we spoke to, to the some tenant then most had choice some back to the estate and we happen to the their new new homes there was a lovely library a lot of local people wanted to the love line scheme to go ahead and asking me how soon work will be happen the people i think they are tired and are fed up to to support this scheme thank you thank you thank you mr um so enid henry are you you're here okay Ms. henry so you have three minutes starting now I would like the new homes that were promised in the law in the letter 10 years ago to be built as soon as possible. I would like to, the same as I got now, but better to be better to keep warm. I want to remain in the love lane area. Looking forward to the new facilities. I would also like my flat to be on the ground floor. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Henry. So we have Suzanne Wolf. Okay, Ms. Wolf, you have three minutes starting now. Hi, me. I'm here today in my capacity as independent tenant and leaseholder advisor to read out statements on behalf of three Love Lane residents who wish for their views to be heard by the committee, but are unable to attend in person. Statement on behalf of Laura Speller. I have been a resident of the Love Lane estate since 2017. We have two children, one of whom has special needs. Myself, my partner went to Elephant Trip so have a look at the re redevelopment and it was absolutely beautiful. I feel that if this redevelopment scheme doesn't go ahead, the council tenants that are currently in accommodation there will be stuck. A majority of the tenants there are suffering with overcrowding and nothing is being done to help us out of this situation. If the redevelopment scheme does go ahead, then 500 new council properties are being built and needs assessments are being done on each household to be able to meet our needs and requirements. During my time on the estate, my mental health has suffered drastically due to being overcrowded and on the fifth floor with a child with special needs. I have spoken to several of my neighbours about the situation that we are all in and they all have the same feelings. I'm worried if this, this does not go ahead, then I'm going to suffer again with my mental health, waiting for our forever home with a child with autism. Stability is needed in their daily routine and I don't wish to be moving my son when the redevelopment seems like the perfect opportunity for us to get our forever home. A statement on behalf of MNA Acker. I am a resident in temporary accommodation at White Hart Lane, living here for about seven years. Our flat is very old and needs many repairs. We don't have a safe entrance. Rough sleepers come inside, use drugs, smoking on the stairs. My kids can't go to school without me. They're scared to go out. I and my husband have to check first that it's safe to go out. Even the garden's not safe. They can easily get into our communal area, making us feel insecure in, in our home. The flat is damp and mouldy and everything is old. 
in my opinion, I believe that if the scheme goes ahead, everything will be changed for the better because I saw the Elephant Park scheme developed by Lend Lease and everything was nice, different from here now. Why can't our kids have the same as what they have there? Every, everywhere is clean at Elephant Park. Here, I cannot take my kids to the park because the park is not safe. I've told my son I can't take him because I don't feel safe. Only my husband feels able to do so. I want more green areas and more play areas. I'm looking forward to having more trees in the area. I want the scheme to start as soon as possible. Statement on behalf of Laura, sorry, Grace Lanu. I am a leaseholder and have lived on Love Lane for 32 years. I would like the proposals to go ahead because they will very much improve our living environments and homes which are dated a source of shade with costly repeat repairs and not in keeping with the changing landscape around the area. Only people who live on the estate would understand how depressing and distressing it is on a daily basis to live at somewhere like this. Thank with you. Thank you, Miss Ford. Can you just finish up your sentence, please? Yeah, I'm alarmed that people do, who don't live on the estate are opposing this proposal when they do not experience what life is like living here. They have nice homes to go to and have no idea what it's like on Love Lane. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Wall. Thank you. Um, OK, we have now have. Please don't shout. Please don't shout. Um, could we have Councillor Carlin now, please? Thank Councillor Carlin, you have three minutes starting now. Haringey has a critical shortage of housing across all tenures, but especially of affordable housing. All of us receive casework about families living in terribly overcrowded accommodation with associated physical and mental effects. People suffering from parents suffering from depression and stress, children underperforming at school, youngsters hanging out in the streets because there's no space for them to have their friends around. We have households who have been in temporary accommodation for over 20 years, and this is not new and it's only getting worse. This application will provide 500 new council homes for our residents. The residents living at Love Lane are living in homes that have suffered from a number of persistent issues such as leak, damp and mould. Just over the last year, we had over a thousand repair jobs raised on the estate. That's more than four and a half per home. For, uh, of the ho lendies of the homes, there are such there are some 44 homes in such bad condition that they are voids and we can't even let them out. Too many Love Lane residents don't have the space that allows their 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 flat to become a home. 80 households are overcrowded, some by as much as two to three bedrooms. As I've said, this application will provide 500 new council homes for our residents. Not only will these homes be built to a high standard, the scheme will provide the additional larger homes that we desperately need. Although we're demolishing the existing Love Lane estate, there will be an additional 165 two bedroom properties and an additional 106 homes that have three or more bedrooms. These homes will be delivered in phase one of the scheme by 28-29. There will also be the new library and the public square. I appreciate that this scheme has generated considerable controversy. However, these are homes that we desperately need and we need them as soon as possible. There is no guarantee that the considerable funding that the GLA has provided to help to build these homes would be available for another plan given the constrained economic circumstances we, ne we now face. We need to deliver these homes for the people of Haringey. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Carlin. Um, so we now have the applicant, um, Beck Seeley, Michelle Letton and Greg Greasley from Lendhurst. And there are um, other people in attendance. I just want to check how much time you have because there's some time. Right, so um, you have five minutes and 10 seconds and your time starts now. Good evening, councillors. I'm Beck Seeley, Managing Director of Lane East Development, the council's development partner for High Road West. This scheme has been nearly 10 years in the making, stemming from the High Road West Master Plan framework. 
Van Lees and I myself have been involved since 2016. During this time, we've worked with the community, council and wider stakeholders to understand how we can offer residents and businesses new opportunities. This has included working closely with the council to ensure that the High Road West scheme will provide 500 new, truly affordable, high quality, energy efficient council homes, enabling all existing eligible Love Lane residents to have a new replacement home, which will be delivered early in the scheme. We have supported Tottenham People Priority, assisted local schools and worked with the community to reinvigorate shop frontages on the high road. In the construction phase of the project, further significant local community opportunities will be available, including many for young people. Alongside the 500 new council homes, High Road West will deliver high quality green spaces for families and new community facilities including a fantastic new library and learning centre. It will also provide affordable, modern workspaces for businesses at the heart of the community. There will be good quality new jobs supported by successful employment programmes for local people. The scheme will be highly sustainable, minimising carbon and energy use and promoting a healthier neighbourhood with improvements for walking and cycling. We are committed to co-design and inclusive engagement throughout the project life cycle. For example, the designs for new homes on Whitehall Mews Plot A have been created in partnership with residents through ongoing workshops over the past two years. We understand that the proposals have concerned a number of local businesses. Over the last four years, we've been consulting with them to better understand their needs and how we might meet them. Together with the council, we are committed to finding the best possible outcome for each business's individual circumstances, including relocation within the site or nearby. The High Road is also home to Tottenham Hotspur Football Club. On match and event days, the impact from fans on local people's lives is easy to see. The proposed scheme will improve things. It will provide more space in a large square to accommodate fans more safely. This scheme will make many things better for the communities that live and work there, and we are ready to move forward with building works later this year. I hope that you can agree with your officer's recommendation to approve this application tonight. Thank you very much for your time, councillors, and we would be pleased to take any questions. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you to the supporters and the applicant. And uh, so members can ask any questions. Do members have questions, please? Councillor Corley Harrison. It's probably a <coughs> question more to the council development team. I'm not sure who's which parts then Lisa, so which ones, which ones Haringey, but it, is it not correct, really, that the, the council is propping this scheme up? from a viability perspective. If you remove the council's land and ability to deliver the 500 social homes which they got through the GLA grant funding, this scheme doesn't, it doesn't hold up. It would be predominantly private. There would be 400 affordable homes, no social homes. So what, why is Haringey doing this? I mean, just remove your land and bring forward your own scheme it's a much better proposition, the position that Haringey is in surely to bring forward a scheme with the expertise you have. I, I think probably as a committee, we need clarification on that because it's hard for us to understand what lend lease are bringing to the scheme in terms of the affordable units and therefore from a viability perspective, how that stacks up given that a lot of the viability actually comes from the GLA funding so I'd like to understand the mechanics of it and what lend lease are bringing to the scheme um, in terms of the, the kind of the percentages from the viability um, financially and from from the units perspective. And also why Haringey aren't bringing forward their own scheme or if they have plans to bring forward their own scheme. Um, I just want to bring in our legal person, please. Thank you. I mean, just to pick up on the last point in terms of 
um, talking about what other schemes could or could not look like. Um, from a planning law perspective, you have to consider the application in front of you. So in terms of the speculation of what could be brought forward on the council's land if it was dealt with separately is, is not a material consideration. The consideration is whether this scheme before you meets the requirements of the development plan having regard to other material considerations. Thank you. OK, can I just slightly rephrase then and say, does this scheme really maximise the opportunity for this area, given the given the, the ability for the council to deliver its own council homes in house? Thank you, Councillor Michelle Luton from Enlace. So I'll take that question. Um, in relation to the um, council, um, we would we would say that to upgrade um, the Love Lane estate uh, rather than to replace it um, would actually be rather costly um, and the grant funding would not be sufficient um, just to replace the existing homes. So what this scheme does is bring forward so much more for the local residents um, and uh, the businesses. So we are providing those outdoor spaces and outdoor play areas um, much more than is there today. Um, and the um, upgrade to the library, um, the socioeconomic pledge from Lendlease, we are providing 10 million pounds uh, to this scheme uh, to help deliver jobs, to upgrade the Grange um, and to provide support um, for um, less privileged. Uh, there would be um, a struggle to deliver the public park um, and uh, Mosul Square. Uh, so we do believe um, that you know, this scheme um, is best um, in this form and the grant funding um, greatly assists uh, in, in the viability. Um, but Lenlace is also um, bringing forward a, a substantial um, contribution as part of this project. Councillor Bevan and then Councillor Ibrahim. So that doesn't really answer the question at all. And it was also directed at the council's development team, not at Lend Lease, to be honest. So um, we're asking questions of the applicant. The applicant is not the council housing delivery team. The applicant is lend lease. Um, so we're going to have to stick to questions to the applicant, councillor. OK, thank you. Moving on, councillor Bevan, please. Yeah, so the public library and learning space, when it is up and running, would you be prepared to grant that to the council on a peppercorn rent? And then the parks and the square, I'm really concerned because we say those 60,000 people leaving that stadium, it's all OK. I've seen it. And although I try to envisage the new scheme, I'm still concerned with those thousands of people, many of them going through this new estate. So the public park and the public square, who maintains them? who pays the bills every week to clear them up is it the leaseholders or the people who move into the new flats because my understanding is that is now private land thank you councillor um, my name is tom horn I, i'm from dp9 with planning advisors advising lend lease um, i will pick up a few of those pieces and then i will ask uh, other colleagues to come in where necessary um, in relation to the public library um, and your point around the peppercorn rent, um, we can confirm that would be the case. So it would be for the council to run that peppercorn rent. Um, in terms of uh, your concerns over crowd flow, sorry, Greg, do you want to come in? Uh, I'd rather correct you, it's not a peppercorn rent, but the building will be built and handed back to the council, so it will be holding. Sorry, sorry, sorry councillor. Um, yeah, just to confirm, Tom, that the library will be owned and hold it handed back in in full to the council so it won't be a peppercorn rent it will be the facility will be owned by the council uh, so it'll be delivered back 
thank you, Greg. Um, in terms of the uh, crowd flow and the area, so at, at present, um, there are a series of existing streets which are used um, to navigate spectators between uh, Tottenham Hotmer Stadium and White Hart Lane Station. They're not obviously designed for large movements of crowds. They are front of people's houses front onto them, people's gardens front onto them, people's front doors front onto them. Um, in this scenario, not only will we not have that, okay, so this will be bespoke to uh, making sure those spectators move safely through the space, but the space will be a lot bigger as well. So the end state is quite considerably bigger than uh, what is currently uh, available. So we think it's a, a much better solution. Um, there'll be a lot less uh, issues over antisocial behaviour, etc., because it's going to be much better managed. Um, and then just coming on to your management point, so um, Tottenham already have responsibility around um, making good the area, litter picking, all that sort of stuff, and, and that responsibility will simply be carried over into this scenario. Councillor Ibrahim. Yes, yeah, so and my question is going back to the um, issue of the um, potential decrease in community and leisure floor space. So we obviously asked a few times about this kind of wide envelope and um, what, why do you need that level of, could you provide me with some reasoning for that level of flexibility, but also is there not the potential to um, commit to no net loss at the very least? Thank you, Councillor. Um, just to confirm, um, there is no net loss of that space. So there is a slight inconsistency in one of the tables in the report which relates to, um, so there are buildings within the site which we're not doing anything to. So for instance, the Grange was within the red line, um, the station master's house is within the red line. So buildings like that are included under the existing floor space, but they're not transposed into the proposed simply because we're not proposing anything to them. Um, we've also, uh, officers have mentioned um, the health centre. So obviously the health centre is down as a, as a loss, but on the basis that a new health centre is delivered through Tottenham's consent, and actually Tottenham have a uh, detailed consent for that building. But if that isn't delivered, and it's not delivered in the time that we get to the phase where the health centre is, we will be delivering a new health centre of, of, of equal to or bigger size that is scaled to represent the, the needs of the community. So not only the existing community, but the bigger community that might need it. So it looks like you want to ask another question, Councillor. Because, um, sorry, because I am referring actually to the document. So perhaps you could, if, if I read it out, you could say to me that if this could be a error in, in the phrasing, but at 4.22, um, it says, and these are the words, the proposal could therefore deliver between a 2,250 square metre GA net loss in community leisure floor space and a 15,250 square metre square metre GA net gain. So my concern is that sentence where it when it, where it says it could deliver a 220, a 2,250 2, square metre net loss. Are you saying that that's been poorly phrased or it's it's incorrect? Thank you, Councillor. I think what we're saying is that it's just missed off those existing buildings. So that there is um, there is that component that sits there. Um, plus, we've, as I said, there's the health centre, um, and then there's also things like the Grace Centre, which is being lost from the site, but obviously is simply moving outside of the red line. So we're confident that there is there is ample community facilities here, and that no net no net loss point sort of falls away. Thank you. Councillor Warren. Thank you. Yeah, mine just really um, picks up on Councillor Ibrahim's point. Um, I think you got the picture that many, many of those are a bit concerned about the idea of signing something off, which does have such sort of wide scope. Um, could you sort of speak more generally about why that needs to be so wide and, and kind of as as Councillor Ibrahim said, you know, is there any scope of tightening it up in any way because obviously the point at which if we were to approve this we then sort of lose any oversight over that yeah thanks thank you councillor um it, it's a very good question i think there is a sort of general principle that i've observed 
in that smaller schemes require less flexibility because they are delivered quicker and over shorter periods of time. And larger schemes generally require larger levels of flexibility because they're delivered over longer periods of time. In my experience, this scheme is an unprecedented. Unprecedented suggests something that's sort of never been done before. This level of flexibility absolutely has been done before. I've worked on schemes where it's happened before. So I, I, you know, we're perfectly comfortable that what we're suggesting uh, is perfectly sensible and perfectly reasonable. Um, they, the development, and this is quite a technical point, but the development specification, which is one of those important documents that is for approval, not only has floor areas in total, so for over the whole development, it also has um, maximum minimums per zone. So there are there is a greater level of um, certainty, I suppose, that sits below that. So it, so we don't have carte blanche to deliver just one land use on, on any block that we wish to. We are required to put in certain uses in, in smaller areas than you might you might be aware of. So for instance, if you take the library and learning centre, that's a bit more specific. So you can't deliver that anywhere. That that's in a specific place, and there are other uses which fall similarly uh, with um, things like employment. Um, and if you take the example of the um, library and learning centre, there's no residential in that plot, for instance. So we can't put residential in that plot. So there is a there is a granular level to this, which is sometimes difficult to get hold of. But as I said, this is not unusual. It's just a factor of this being a very large scheme. You know, it's eight and a half hectares. It's it's many many homes. It's many many square meters of uh, employment floor space, etc. So, and, and that's what we would normally expect to see. Chair, if I may just <clears throat> remind councillors about the um, the compliance report, which I mentioned earlier on, on page 499, um, which will come with, with every reserved matter. So um, that does give a, a degree of control or, or oversight of this that, that you can see and what is proposed across the um, the master plan with with each submission. So um, I think um, that that sense that there's absolutely no control um, is somewhat unfair. Um, that you, you will get sight of of the uses um, as they come forward through reserve matters. Thank you. Do members have are there any any other questions, Councillor? Uh, so Councillor Bartlett. Thank you. Um, there was some concern expressed by the quality review panel about the density of the development, but also the provision of um, green space and play space um, in light of that. And, it, and there's some concern expressed about when that comes within the scheme. Would you be able to say any more about that, given that you know, obviously it's it's something that's going to evolve over time and also kind of in light of what you said about the um, fans passageway through the site. There's some concern that, that those bits like Moselle Square will become public spaces, which is a positive contribution, but there's not enough focus on the residents and the areas that they have. So I wonder if you could speak to some of those concerns. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Um, I'm going to ask my colleague Lucas from SEW, the architect, to um, help me answer a couple of those points. If I start with your last point first around the uh, around Mosul Square, I think um, there's been a huge amount of focus on it as a mechanism for crowd flow. I think actually there's been an enormous effort from our team to demonstrate that this is a space that for most of the working week, most of the year, is actually a space for residents. So there is a lot of good stuff that will go in there, things that will be interactive, you know, lovely, beautiful public realm. There will also be cafes and things that open onto that space. So it will be a really inviting space for the community, but it has that dual function of also being a, a safe uh, and open space for spectators. <clears throat> so it's doing a lot of things, but we think it's, it's doing everything very well indeed. Um, I think at that point I'll invite Lucas just to have a just to mention about density uh, where the QRP were uh, and we'll try and cover green space and play space at the same time. Hello, uh, Lucas Lawrence from Studio Agri West with uh, Master Plan Designers um, for the scheme. Um, I think the the um, question of density is sort of illustrated quite well in comparing the scheme to other similar schemes in uh, in in London at the time that, that currently built. 
Um, and for example, one of the schemes that's been um, cited today is Elephant Park, um, which has a density of 276 dwellings per hectare. We have density here of 305 dwellings per hectare. So it's very, very comparable um, and less than other schemes um, like Brent Cross, a scheme up in Brent Cross, for example, which is a sort of similar location in London. So the I think the question of overall density across the whole site is that we feel it's a, a very appropriate density um, for the type of development. Um, then there's a question of density around where it sits within the site. And obviously there's uh, some competing elements around where, th where the density should, uh, should sit in the site. We've got uh, historic assets, which we need to respect and, uh, and keep uh, tall buildings away from. Um, and then we've got the transport hub and there's a, a general um, uh, ambition and policy position to try and keep density close to the transport hub. So we should be putting the densest areas closest to the transport hub. So this has all been worked through over a number of years with, uh, with your design officers and, and with the QRP. Um, in relation to um, density and place, I think um, public space that you were talking about and Moselle Square becoming being a public space, um, rest assured that the, the place space provision for individual homes that sits within the master plan in across the whole master plan in the, and in the and, uh, in the densest area as well, which is around the station, the play space for young children, for example, uh, sits wholly within the um, uh, the podium garden. So that's protected um, for the for the youngest children, so um, zero to four, um, and that's protected away from the public spaces. Um, and then obviously older children who want to go and kick footballs and things can go and uh, use the park or other local. Uh, green spaces. So there's been lots of care and attention to making sure that uh, the amenity provision is is, is there and and uh, of the highest quality. Uh, sorry, just the last thing to add to Luke's answer um, on the place space, it's, it's policy compliant in that sense. So all the things that we need to be doing in that area, we're we're, we're doing. Yes, Chair, thank you. Um, conscious we um, haven't heard from our design officer on this point of, of density, um, and um, he has been um, involved firsthand in, in um, the pre-application discussions at the QRP and could perhaps um, explain the controls we'll have um, working with the QRP um, over the reserve matters on the issues um, you've heard about density. <coughs> thank you. Um, yes, uh, so the QRP report, well, the QRP has, has, has um, examined this scheme several times. Uh, and the final report um, was broadly welcoming of the proposals. It, there were some criticisms and it was quite nuanced. Um, there were some concerns about the delivery, deliverability of the, of the Peacock Park, which we've heard various things about, um, but perhaps there's a slight misunderstanding about the, the phasing and don't forget that Half of the Peacock Park has already got planning permission, thanks to the Census Spurs previous planning applications. Um, but the main concerns that the QRP in their last review of the scheme had was over the design and height and, 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 uh, and so on of um, the second and third tallest buildings within the within plots B and plot um, F. So they were happy with the tallest building in plot D and they were very happy with the square. So they're happy with most of the south. They're happy with the low rise elements of the south. They're happy with the detailed design proposal in the south. You know, um, you see the images behind you. So the only bits they were not completely happy with was elements to do with plots B and plots G, eh, plots F. And um, changes have been made since the final QRP, uh, including uh, the applicants have made changes to the design code, which is an important part of the control documents and that we will be holding the applicants to. Um, we, I, I will be very keen to make sure that particularly hold them to the uh, alternative proposals they've come up with for plots B and F, uh, which pull the, on, on, on plot B, um, create more space around the podium garden, including an, a wider area of public space, making sure that more daylight and sunlight gets into the podium and more of the flats can be dual aspect and can be well lit. And on plot, on plot F, moving the tall building away from the White Hart Lane frontage so it'll have less impact on the conservation area, on the heritage assets on, on, on the north side and generally have a more pleasing streetscape. Um, 
with, with the tower also subject to further design uh, controls. So we'll, we will be closely interrogating all the reserve matters applications, bringing them back to you, bringing them back to QRPs, having as many QRPs are required to get a positive review on each reserve matters application um, as we go forward through the process. But as I say, they, have, they, they were broadly happy with a few nuanced concerns, particularly focused on plots B and plot F, which we think we've um, resolved those outstanding concerns in the subsequent revisions to the design codes and in the um, controls we'll have as reserve matters come forward going forward from here. Councillor Corley Harrison. Thanks, Chair. <clears throat> um, when the schemes come, well, of the 8.6 hectares, how much land does Len Lease own at the moment? And how much will it own or be freeholder or landowner or responsible for upon completion? And how much of that is currently council land that will be handed over? Uh, and then I'd like you to comment on the single asset units. I think we're still at 35% there or thereabouts, which I think the committee raised concerns about at the pre app, you know, that we had. Um, how many of those are sound? Uh, a number likely to come down because that's very, very high. And I'd also like to go back to John's point that he made to um, Richard relating to costs and viability being um, estimated based on six months ago. What's Len Lease's plans if costs escalate or if the figures are different now to what they were? Would, for example, as Mr. Serra suggested could happen, the library only be 500 square metres. What are you looking at elsewhere on the site that you could consider um, being able to be pinched, let's say? Um, thank you, Councillor. Um, I think we'll start with your middle point first about the single aspect um, units, and, and I might draw um, Lucas in again just to help me answer this question. Um, my main observation is we've done an illustrative scheme purely to demonstrate what the capacity what, what could be delivered so what is a compliance scheme that is broadly compliant with um, the development specification the parameter plans uh, and the design code that's not the scheme that we're applying for so there's lots of flexibility in that architecture and actually um, mr truscott has, has eloquently pointed out that we did explore other other different arrangements that all fit within those parameters so we have the ability to relook really at all of these aspects of how many single aspect homes are they, what the orientation is, where the windows are, and all those parts. So none of that is fixed. So the, the figures that you're hearing are in relation to the illustrative, which is just one way of doing it. And of course, as has, been, has already been stated, we'll be coming back to you um, to, to seek approval for those detailed buildings once we've had an opportunity to design them. Um, Lucas, is there anything you'd add to that? Can I can I just come in before you do um, members? I refer you to committee standing order 18 that says no meeting shall continue after 10 p.m. except that discussion of the specific item in hand at 10 p.m. may continue thereafter at the discretion of the chair of the meeting. I'm using my discretion as chair to continue and to complete the item in hand, which is agenda eight. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Just to answer your question about dual aspect, um, as uh, uh, Tom suggests, the scheme is designed as an illustration of, of um, what might be possible and is only a certain portion along the way of the whole design process to design the whole building. So this is really looking at the foundation of, of that design moving forwards. Uh, it takes a relelatively simple approach to the calculation um, of, of dual aspect and so only counts homes that are um, corner or dual or triple aspect at 64.5%. So as those all of the plots on the site are, are, are developed in more detail, we would expect that to rise as the nuance and, and individual layouts of all the homes are, are, are explored further. I'd also just like to point out that um, uh, some of the constraints on site, I think it was mentioned earlier, um, uh, demand that certain blocks have um, 
more single aspect um, where they have a particular constraint, for example, at the back of the high street. Um, and on the flip side, other plots like the tallest building on the site plot, plot D, that whole plot uh, is achieving 84% dual aspect that's currently drawn. Um, so there's a real, there is real opportunity to uh, increase that uh, level of dual aspect across the site as the reserve matters come in and you'll have the opportunity to, uh, to, to um, take a judgment on that um, as they do. OK, thank you. Councillor White. Sorry, there was two other questions. Once. Yeah, I, I will pick up the last two. Thank you, Councillor. Um, in terms of the ownership at the moment, um, Lend Lease um, is not the owner of the land. We will draw down a lease or a licence um, with Council over time. Um, in relation to your cost escalation question, um, what we would typically do, Lend Lease is also a, con a construction company as well as a developer. Um, we are really used to cycles, economic cycles, um, and we will go through many of them throughout this, the journey on this project. Um, how we typically manage cycles as a business, um, we would look to on the construction side and with our contractors, we would look at contract form, contract type. Uh, we would look into lock in um, where, where the goods are coming from in terms of foreign exchange. Uh, we always are exploring different ways of delivery um, to move to um, design for manufacturing and assembly. So looking at different methods off site, um, which can also speed up delivery um, and reduce cost and also are improvements in safety risk in delivering. Um, we obviously would be managing the design um, development throughout the project um, and we have um, through our viability reviews One is six for absolute. So those commitments in terms of affordable housing um, and the library and learning centre. Um, and there is also a commitment with the council in terms of delivering that library and learning centre and the size of it, the specification. So all of those are absolutes that we are committed to. So the onus is on us to, to find those ways to to bring things forward. And I think as Michelle said, the key thing is that that cycle. We're all aware that construction prices go up and they, they do come back down or revenues align with them over, over the long period of time and a 10 to 15 year project like this, that's what we'd expect to happen. So I think it'd be wrong to assume that the scheme becomes unviable or is a squeeze or there's a fundamental change to the key benefits that are being offered in the scheme because we've committed to them. And Chair, if it may just come in, um, another point on, on single aspect homes. Um, and um, the, the question related to um, how many of those are, are south facing, um, I would just draw your attention to um, condition 49, um, which is an energy strategy. Um, so that's to be submitted, um, sorry, page 486 over to 487, if you want to see the detail, but that requires an energy strategy to be, to be submitted with every reserve matter, and that will look at overheating. So um, that will also um, potentially reduce the number of single aspect homes. Councillor White. Thanks, Chair. Um, so I'm referring here to um, paragraph 5.30 in the report, which talks about the right to return for the uh, 251 households uh, living on the Lovelane estate. And specifically, uh, it says at the end of that paragraph on page 71, the phasing approach seeks to ensure residents will only need to move once through a single move approach where possible. Um, so then going to the uh, condition that relates to this, which uh, I believe is condition three phasing plan, it doesn't actually mention the uh, the single move approach there. Uh, um, and I'm just wondering, um, I mean, maybe maybe the applicant can comment on this, but maybe also officers can comment, comment on this, whether there is, is scope for that condition to be amended to reflect that, that that one of the reasons for having a phasing plan is to ensure where possible to the maximum possible extent uh, residents on the estate only have to move once. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, maybe I'll answer that in part in the first place. So obviously the, the right to return stuff is, is nothing is not to do with us. That's obviously the, the uh, Harrogate homes arm of, um, of the council and how that process is, is sort of played out. 
Um, the single move is a, is a really important point and, and we're going to obviously be making every effort we can so that it is only one single move, but we also need to be cognizant of the fact we, we're knocking down buildings and putting new buildings back with residents in them. Um, and it's, you know, that, that is a very complicated process and we, we obviously haven't worked through the absolute detail of all of that yet. And the phasing plan allows us to explore that in more detail to make sure we get it get it to a place that we that is as good as it can possibly be. If, if you'll allow me, Chair, um, so just is, is it possible to make mention in the condition that the phasing plan should um, um, take account of the uh, uh, the aim to, 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 to maximise single move where possible? Uh, uh, we have committed to that with the Council. Chair, could the question now be put? Yes, sorry, Chair, I was going to come in on that if that's OK. Um, I think Councillor Rice was perhaps going to ask for it to be put to me. Um, sure. Yes, and sorry not for jumping on that sooner. Um, I, I, it does seem appropriate um, that, that it could be included in there. Um, some additional wording to say um, that she'll seek to, to minimise um, moves um, you know, as much as, as is possible um, or, or wording to that effect. Um, I think that that would be an appropriate amendment to um, condition three to to um, to bring that in, into the control of planning. And just to um, elaborate on what Mr. McNock has said, um, the reason why it cannot be 100% fully committed to, albeit striving to, and, and then least outside of the conditions are making that commitment from what they've said today, um, but we need to make sure there's not unintended consequences of that um, or that it might slow down um, the build out of the development, so we need to make sure that those considerations are, are factored in as well. So I think the, the wording that Mr. Menocca, um, uh set out should be enough to um, address the concern via a condition. OK, so Councillor Corley Harrison. Chair, be before Co Councillor Corley Harrison comes in, I did make a, a standing request, that is that this matter be now put to the committee for a decision. So, well, someone would have to second that, but I think we are concluding the, the debate. There, I only have one question. OK, then, so if you yeah. can and then OK. So it relates to um, some of the objectors, which is um, given that there's quite a lot of flexibility in the proposals, um, why there wasn't um, enough flexibility to allow the right to remain for some of the businesses, um, the Peacock State businesses, rather than them being moved off site. What, what, what was the background for that decision and why wasn't that allowed? Thank you, Councillor. In response to that, the application with the flexibility within the application allows for the provision of enough space to provide for all of the existing businesses on the site if they requested and wanted to to return. So there is still the that scope still sits within the commitment. The commitments we made um, at or Avnometi made around delivering 4,600 square metres of commercial space that is actually in the application as a minimum amount. So we have committed to and maintained our promises there. And we have made provision within section 106 to provide um, incentives and preferential treatment to businesses within the red line to stay within the scheme um, or to move outside the scheme. And that's in the form of rent um, free periods or capital contributions as they so wish. So there is a real commitment to try and keep as many of the businesses on site as possible. Just like the, the, the phase, just, 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 just carry on, please. Just, just like, just, carry on. just as with the phasing uh, of, um, and of the homes for people, again, it's, it, you know, it's complex in trying to make sure we can phase the provision of new workspace uh, before we remove existing workspace so that we can provide as much replacement as possible. So there is an ambition to keep as many businesses as possible on the scheme, but that might not be completely possible. But 
OK, thank you. So. We'll now move. Um, are there any other questions? No, OK, thank you very much uh, to the committee. Um, oh, Councillor Warren, just quickly, please. Am I allowed to ask questions to the officers? A final one. It's OK. Um, it was just about this issue of the viability of the development and the GLA funding and the need for certain time limits to be met. Um, I just feel like there are a lot of things that maybe in an ideal world would still be ironed out. Um, and it, it does feel like a bit of a sort of a, an added thing to consider about, about this this funding and, I, and I'm not sure whether it should. Um, and yeah, it, it, is that like a hard and fast thing? It, if 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 we can't agree this one way or the other tonight, it might not be able to happen at all. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I think it's worth noting our, our recommendation is that th this is an acceptable development and meets the development plan. Um, it's a material consideration that, that this funding is available and, and something that um, we, we um, believe members should um, be aware of and be mindful of. Um, but um, we can only go so far in terms of the, the technical detail of that. Um, it, it's a risk that, that you should bear in mind in, in your consideration, but um, we find that the, the development is acceptable um, and um, you, should, you should really bear that in mind as your sort of primary concern that spending longer on this um, wouldn't wouldn't make it any more acceptable. Um, so I think you probably have to uncouple those points and, and um, satisfy yourself that um, there's an acceptable planning application on the table and, and that you have you can only consider that application. You can't consider alternatives. OK, any other questions? No, OK, thank you and thank you um, to the supporters and the applicant. Um, OK, so we um, will now move to the recommendation and I would like to ask Robbie McNocker to confirm the recommendation with a summary of any changes. Thank you, Chair. Yes, um, so the recommendation is um, to grant approval and um, subject to referral to um, the GLA um, through stage two um, conditions and the section 106. Those are as set out in the addendum and the um, amendment um, made to um, condition three to minimise the moves as much as feasible. Thank you. OK, so we will now vote. So all those in favour of, of granting the recommendation, please show. Any abstentions? OK, thank you. So that is the recommendation is approved. Thank you. OK, so we're moving on to item nine. Any uh, there are uh, no um, new items of urgent business. Oh, it's, it's after 10 anyway, so that's John date of next meeting. And the date of the next meeting is the 5th of September. That's now the end of the meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you.